Good evening, everyone. My name is Scott Martzoff, Superintendent of Williamsville Central School District. And we are here this evening to share some information about our school district reopening plan. Uh, after that information is shared with all of the audience members and participants, we will give people uh, a chance to ask questions that they might uh, want to know about. And uh, we will remain here as long as we need to, to answer uh, as many questions as we can. And I'll share some information later on in the presentation about follow-up meetings that we're planning for next week. Uh, so at this time, I'm going to bring up uh, a PowerPoint presentation and uh, begin to share that with you. I shared this uh, photo last night at our Board of Education meeting. It is a picture of the hallway at North Paulding High School in Dallas, Georgia. And it basically shows you a very crowded hallway where students don't seem to be wearing very many masks. And it's interesting to note that uh, at this particular school, there's at least five of the students that have uh, been diagnosed with the virus, as well as at least three staff members and uh, they were planning to close the school as of a couple days ago. So this shows you what can happen in a school when precautions are being taken. And I'll talk more about some of those precautions that we uh, intend to instill here in the Williamsville Central School District. So it's interesting to note the following are still closed, movie theaters, gyms, uh, restaurants have indoor dining restrictions, and then there's other things like weddings and celebratory gatherings where there's restrictions on how many people can be a part of those. Uh, so uh, these are the things that we still cannot do, yet we're being asked to plan for the reopening of school uh, on September the 8th. What are some actions we've taken so far? We sent out a parent survey on July 1st to gather feedback and data. Uh, you can find the results of that survey summarized on a PowerPoint on our website. Uh, we established a reopening committee and held meetings on July 15th, 23rd, and 30th. We sent a staff survey out on July 23rd to gather feedback and data. And then we drafted a plan uh, and shared it with our reopening committee and all of our school principals uh, at the end of July and submitted it to New York State. Uh, the feedback uh, provided to all parents via with mail each week uh, for the past four weeks has been done by the school district uh, to try to make sure people uh, understand what's happening, some of the changes taking place, some of the decisions that have been made and things of that nature. And then we established the date of tonight for our community forum with Williamsville Central School District stakeholders. Who was on our reopening committee? These are the administrators. We had a principal from each level. We had district office administrators, including, uh, for example, our assistant superintendents, our athletic director, and our director of facilities, as well as Mrs. Harding, our district nurse practitioner, uh, to bring in the medical point of view uh, to our discussions. We also had a number of teachers from across the district. These were the eight teachers that were uh, part of our committee from all around the district to provide input, to ask questions, and also to communicate with their colleagues about what was being discussed and talked about so that they could uh, follow up at our next uh, reopening committee meeting. And then lastly, we had, I believe it was 17 parents that were all a part of this. These parents were chosen uh, relatively randomly. Uh, these parents uh, come from across our school district. Some of them have children with special needs. Uh, some of them have uh, elementary age children. Some of them have middle school or high school age. Some of them have multiple children. So we wanted to get a, a diverse uh, perspective uh, from our parents going into this uh, reopening committee. So what is our goal? Uh, the goal of our reopening plan is to maximize the health and safety of students and staff as they return to school uh, this September. I think sometimes that gets lost in some of the discussions. Everybody wants to see certain things happen. Everybody wants certain opportunities for their children. 
Um, but at the same time, we have to keep in mind, just like that picture from the high school in Georgia shows you, we need to take affirmative steps to make our students and staff healthier and safer uh, as they come back to school. And that's uh, a really big challenge. We also wanna inform our stakeholders of some of those steps we're taking uh, so that everyone is on the same page, uh, everyone understands uh, what needs to be done. And it's important for everyone to realize a return to school does not mean a return to normalcy. There was a certain normalcy to life in uh, late February, early March before uh, we canceled school for the rest of the year. That normalcy will be different uh, when students return to our schools. And I'll talk more about that uh, in a few minutes. Um, but it's important for people to know that everyone is gonna play a role in that. Students will certainly play a role. Administrators and teachers will play a role. Parents will play a role. Um, everybody has to be working together to make this plan work and to help keep, keep everyone as healthy and safe as possible. So here's uh, just a few, a look, a brief look at our reopening guidance documents. You can go online. There are also links to these on our website and you can read everything from the State Education Department, New York State Department of Health, uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, OSHA, Erie County Department of Health, and then of course the governor's executive orders and updates. So feel free to, uh, to read those if that's something you have a high degree of interest in. I wanna start with talking about health and safety and what we talked about with the reopening committee. First, it's important to know that there has to be a health screening with a daily temperature check. We're asking parents to do this at home in the morning with their children and report it via WITS uh, to our school district. Uh, we wanna make sure kids are not uh, coming down with the virus. And we wanna make sure that their temperature is not elevated. Obviously, um, it can be quite hectic in the morning to get kids to school, to get yourself ready for uh, your job or other activities and responsibilities that you have. So we wanna make sure uh, that we have a follow-up to that um, to assess any ill students and isolate them uh, if they do come to school and we do not have this check-in uh, through WITS from a child's parent. Uh, so we will have a way to take temperatures in the school of lots of students at once. And we will have a way to follow up with those students uh, when we have concerns to make sure uh, that they are healthy. Uh, the student, parent, and staff, uh, education and communication are going to continue to be critical throughout this process. Uh, social distancing is going to be a challenge uh, to keep students six feet or more away from one another. Uh, can be uh, quite the challenge, particularly when uh, they haven't seen each other as much as they normally would do uh, because school was canceled uh, for the spring. Uh, but we need to be constantly reminding students to stay uh, apart from one another. And the same thing goes for our staff. Uh, we need to make sure people maintain that healthy distance. A face covering or a mask is going to be required for anyone that comes onto our school grounds. And this will begin when children board our school buses. If children do not have a mask when they get on our school buses, we will provide one for them at that time so that they can put it on. Uh, personal protective equipment will be provided, uh, masks, uh, face shields for certain employees, other protective equipment for our um, folks that work in our school district that we find uh, as necessary. Daily cleaning, of course, will take place. Uh, we're gonna deep clean and make sure that not only do we clean, but that we also disinfect. Uh, we wanna disinfect all of our surfaces and make sure that we're taking affirmative steps uh, to mitigate the potential spread of this virus. Uh, in connection with the Erie County Department of Health, uh, we will look at what to do if someone does get sick. Obviously there are rules on this for HIPAA, confidentiality. So we'll wanna be careful of those. Uh, but we understand that if someone gets sick at a certain school, the rest of the teachers and staff and students and parents at that school would probably want to know 
that there was a positive case. So we will work with the Erie County Department of Health on that, as well as what steps we need to take, if any, for quarantine of uh, any of our students or staff members in our district. We are going to start the school year with a hybrid instruction model. And essentially what that means is we'll have four groups of students. Group A will be Monday and Tuesday. Group B will be Thursday and Friday. Group C will be every day except for Wednesday. And group D will be every day. Group A students will be essentially uh, students with the last names A through L. And they will be in the classrooms Mondays and Tuesdays. Group B students will be last names M through Z and they will be in the classrooms on Thursdays and Fridays. Group C will be English language learners who will attend class Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Group D will include students in self-contained classes. So eight to one, 12 to one, 15 to one. Uh, our intention is to have them to be in classrooms Monday through Friday. Uh, there's been some questions about online instructional services. What does it mean if parents choose to keep their child out of school? Parents have that right. And uh, we just put information on WITS today, late this afternoon, for what that will look like. We, uh, our intention is to not use BOCES for grades 7 through 12. We hope to be able to utilize our own staff and teachers uh, to provide online learning opportunities uh, for all of our students K through 12. Uh, there's information on WITS about that. And I just wanna be clear that for this particular option, it doesn't have every single thing available to students um, for uh, those families that pick this option uh, for their child. Some of our next steps, we're gonna continue professional development opportunities for all of our teachers. A lot of that has been focused on online learning. We're gonna to continue to evaluate and comply with additional changes to the school reopening plan. It's important for everyone to realize that last week when it was announced, we had to have a plan for uh, doing virus tests and doing contact tracing um, with our students and staff. Uh, at that time was the first that we as a school district had heard about that requirement. So we're finding out right at the same time that everyone else is finding out. So that makes it uh, uh, a little bit hurried sometimes to try to put the plan together that's going to meet the needs of our school community. We're also as required uh, through this, are gonna hold additional community meetings uh, for our elementary schools, that'll be this Monday, August 17th at 6 p.m. Uh, middle schools will be on Tuesday, high school is Wednesday, and all of our teachers, staff members, and employees are welcome to join on Thursday at 6 p.m. All of these will be through Zoom. And the reason we're doing that uh, is because we have construction going on at our schools. A lot of our auditoriums are available with uh, that construction going on. This uh, concludes uh, the presentation and we'll close out of this and get ready to uh, answer questions that people have. Um, I would just share with all of our parents and community members that if anyone has questions, please tell us your questions so we can have a discussion about those. Um, but we're really not looking for a speech or for uh, someone to uh, give their view on the world or whatever it might be. We're really interested in trying to answer people's questions uh, as accurately and succinctly as possible. So uh, this time, ask people to come forward and answer, ask a question. Hello. Hello, Kyle. How you guys doing tonight? Thanks for doing this. Sure, you're welcome. I, I got a couple quick ones, if I may. Um, just wondering, um, 
I know we we fill out the survey, and you guys said you would follow the survey with the parents um, decided. The first question on the survey was, 48% of the students should return to normal as full classes. So a majority wanted that. How come you guys decided to go a two-day-a-week hybrid model instead of what the parents asked for? That's a great question. And what I'll tell you is this. Um, two or three weeks ago, things changed and required us to do social distancing, even if we required masks on all of our students and staff members. And so with having to do social distancing, there is no way we can have all of our students in class at the same time and keep people uh, socially distant. Gotcha. And then my follow-up to that is, um, you know, if, you're go if the kids are going, well, in, you know, my, my child will be going two days a week. Um, so are they doing remote learning the, the other three days or what's the plan for that? Yeah, the way it will work is on Wednesday, there'll be some remote online learning. And then the other two days a week, as it stands right now today, uh, they will work on assignments and projects and other assessments uh, to be able to turn them in when they go back to school the following week. Okay, gotcha. And then, and then is there any kind of um, like funding set aside for computers for the students, um, Wi-Fi, um, credits or, or, you know, bill credits, electricity, stuff like that, that the kids would now have, or the parents would have to be responsible for now the kids would be at home. Also, yeah. and I don't know, maybe this is not your question, but just for, you know, is there funding for the parents um, for obviously, you know, missing work and, and setting time aside to teach the children and be with the children instead of being at work and getting paid? I mean, how are they getting compensated? I guess I want to ask. How are parents being compensated? That's correct. Yeah, because because if the child's receiving, you know, a forty percent education in the classroom only two days a week, um, that's they're going to fall behind, and I just don't agree with it. I would just just offer my opinion quick. I mean, why didn't we decide to go full five days a week? And if the parents didn't want to do that, you could have the option where it was one hundred percent virtual five days a week. Why, why wasn't that give? Why wasn't that option given like other districts, you know, around Western New York? I'm having trouble following your questions now because you've asked several of them, but we have offered the option today of full-time online learning. That's an option for families, for their children. Um, no, yeah, I, I, yeah, but I understand that. But I'm saying the option, you know, for a full five days a week in-classroom instruction. Like, why, why wasn't it up? You know, why can't we decide whether to send the kids to school or not? I mean, you know, home, homeschooling was always an option for parents. So they could have always homeschooled their child five days a week if they wanted to. I mean, no, it's not homeschooling. You know. this, is the, this is the district providing an online option five days a week for students. Um, what you just described is if a parent decides to sort of keep their kid home and educate them themselves, then that's a different scenario. That's another option. Um, the option of sending kids to school every day is not available because it goes against the rules. We cannot go to students if we have a full process that's in school. Okay, and, and my last one real quick too. Um, I know you guys are providing cleaning now of the schools on certain days when the kids aren't there. Um, what was your plan for sanitizing the schools in years past for like the cold and flu viruses? I mean, given that the reports out are now that those are more contagious um, and more people will get those. Like, why, why wasn't cleaning and sanitizing done in years past? And all of a sudden, we're going to do it now. I can't speak to the years past. I, you know, that was before my time. But I will tell you, we are going to deep clean every single evening in all 13 of our schools to make sure things are cleaned and disinfected. Uh, and we'll make every effort to keep it as clean as possible. But please know, if someone has the virus yeah. and they touch a surface, then all of a sudden that can change things very quickly. And, what, and then the last one, what happens if the, if the kids don't participate in the online learning the other three days? Like, is that, are they penalized for not doing the work or logging in anything? Like what's the protocol for that? 
Yeah, we're having meetings on that right now with a committee of individuals. As you know, the grading was a little different at the end of last year. We need to review that and figure out what's the best uh, process and product for grading uh, that makes the most sense for our students and our teachers. So we'll be releasing more information on that once uh, that committee concludes their work. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Schupenhauer. Appreciate uh, your questions. And uh, we'll go to our next uh, participant at this time. Hi. Hi, Jennifer Sinatra. Yes. Hi, welcome uh, to our meeting. Thank you. And thank you guys for doing this. Um, my question is simply, why do we not have like the Monday, Tuesday group? Why don't they have a live camera like Zoom or something in the classroom so that the kids that are home can still be part of that group at that time? And the same thing with the Thursday, Friday. Yeah, we've, you know, talked, like a we've talked about that and had discussions about it internally. Um, we decided not to go in that direction for right now, but it doesn't mean it won't change between now and the school year. You know, some of the concerns you have, if you're going to, for example, advertise what's going on in the classroom, um, the camera is probably going to be stuck in one position. You know, the people at home might not be able to quite hear everything or see everything or participate fully, uh, things of that nature. So those are just some of our concerns that we would want to review and be comfortable with before we uh, make a determination that's, that that is how we would do it and the steps we would take. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Do you have other questions, Jennifer? Um, the only other question I had was why did we choose to go two days on and five days off? But I think I have my answer on that. But you may want to answer for everyone else. <laughs> Jennifer, I did not hear your question at all. It sounded like you were in a tunnel for a minute. Uh, um, my question was originally why two days on and five days off? But I believe I have my answer, but you may want to answer for everyone else. Yeah, that's another one we've had discussions about, but as of right now, that's the decision we've decided to go with. Could that change between now and September 8th? Yeah, it could, um, but we don't really see a big compelling reason to do that. Okay. All right, thank you. That is all my questions right now. You're welcome, thank you. Hi, Craig. Yep. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I have quite a few questions, actually. I may have missed uh, this first one I have, but are all the staff being tested prior to opening, including bus drivers, cleaners, uh, librarians, nurses, teachers, et cetera, et cetera? No, they're not. And why? Cosmetologists no had to be tested every two weeks in the beginning and whatever phase they opened and you're going to send a bunch of kids to a school with a bunch of staff and they haven't even been tested to see if they're positive? There's no law that would really allow us to do that on a across the, uh, across the board way. If someone uh, was indicating that they were sick or they had a temperature or they had any of the symptoms, then we could uh, do that. Uh, and we will do that. Um, but to test every single person um, prior to coming in, that's not something we have a plan to do. So it's kind of opening up a can of worms, basically not knowing if anybody could possibly be positive, seeing as how people have been exposing themselves all summer, or maybe not like ourselves, but okay, on to the next question. <clears throat> So do you have, when there is a positive case in the school, is there testing or tracing set up so that they can go back and trace to see if, you know, any of the students or other staff members have been exposed? 
Yeah, that'll be done in conjunction with the Erie County Department of Health. Okay. Also medical providers. Uh, one of the questions we have is if we say, here's how you can get tested, and a parent may say, no, I don't want to do that. I want to take my child to his pediatrician or her pediatrician and get tested there. Um, you know, that could be their choice. Right. But I think it might take a little bit longer to get the results of those tests than it might through a means the district might try to pursue. Gotcha. And then once you do find out that there's a positive case, parents will be notified, even if it's outside of their classroom, correct? No, we, we have not finalized that yet. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, there are different privacy laws in, uh, in, uh, that involve things like HIPAA, where we're not sure what we're going to be allowed to share or not share. I would think that parents and students and staff would want to know there is a positive case in their school or even in their district. But um, I don't know that we can share that uh, because it might violate someone's confidentiality. Well, in, in the past, you've been able to notify parents if somebody had scabies or strep throat or even the flu. So that would violate HIPAA. So COVID should be no different. And I definitely feel people and parents and families should be notified. That makes I, no, no I sense. To me. We'll do our best to do that, but we want to make sure we're on the right side of the law. Yeah, we're not asking you to name the person, but, you know, if uh, people have been exposed, I mean, it's just common courtesy, really. I is there, is there, okay, moving on to the next question. Is there going to be a separate room for suspected virus in the nurse's office or somewhere so that kids with fevers are not exposed to other children? And, yeah. what, would, and what would a fever be consisted of now that you can't even go into like your doctor's office if you're over 100 What's going to be the standard temperature for uh, in the um, school? Because before you couldn't come to school if you're over 101, but some people run low grade fevers and have the virus. Yeah, I'll let Mrs. Uh, Harding, our school nurse practitioner, answer your question about the uh, fever level and, okay. uh, and the uh, isolation room. Mrs. Harding? Hi, hi, Mrs. Ferber. Hi. hi have some great questions. The identified threshold when you're looking at a fever or an elevated temperature with respect to COVID, and this all comes from New York State Department of Health, is a temperature of 100. Okay. So that is the threshold and the criteria um, that we would um, utilize. With respect so, to, go ahead. Sorry, so 100 or greater. Yes. So if they're 99.8, they're okay. <laughs> we have we have to we have to define a threshold somewhere. So we use the criteria from the Department of Health. All right. If, um, their criteria is lower than the CDC criteria of 100.4. So I would hope that a parent, they have a child with a temperature of 99.8, would recheck their child's temperature. And consult with the school district um, if they were concerned in any way. So we are always happy to do that. That's why we have our school nurses and personnel to assist families. With okay, well, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt, but I'm going to be honest. We all know that not every parent is going to check their kids' temperatures and they're going to lie or not do it. So I just feel that every classroom should have a thermometer and test the children every single day, especially because they're only class sizes are going to be down to maybe 10 students and it takes five seconds. So it'll take them not even a minute to check every student's temperature once they get into that classroom. I just do not agree with parents being held responsible. Some will be responsible and some we know will not. We know that parents send their kids to school all the time with temperatures. And I just feel like this is really going to open up another can of worms and just spread the virus because that's all it takes is one person, as we know, to spread it like wildfire. Uh, fire. So, as Dr. Martzloff mentioned, we will be checking students' temperatures upon arrival to school, in addition to the required temperature check and health screening questionnaire that we ask parents to do prior to their child coming to school. So I thought you said that only kids would be test checked if it wasn't documented that they were checked at home. Did I mishear that? 
we will be test we will be screening temperatures upon arrival to school as well. We have so how will you how will you do that? We uh, have thermal screening devices that measures the thermal um, the temperature of the surface temperature of your hand. It's actually a fist um, thermal screening device, so it measures the um, temperature in your let's say your arteries is what it's doing. So it is and a measurement of a temperature, and if there is a result that is flagged in the system, we have a process for a, our school nurse to take an actual temperature to verify the result. So who will be performing this, and will it be outside, inside, in the classrooms? How is it exactly that going to, this risk temperature going to work? We have a process in place for that that will be indoors upon entry to the building. Oh, so before they even get to their classes? Yes. So some kids might actually be a little bit warmer, you know, if it's really hot out or if they have all the coats on and all that stuff. So how many people are going to be testing this um, and how are you going to get kids in, in the school if every single kid has to be tested prior to even entering the school? Like I mean, are they going to all stand near one another? I mean, how are they going to social distance? I, I guess I just don't understand when you have hundreds of kids going into, you know, for in my case, an elementary school safely to get every kid's temperature. Like, how are you going to, who's going to supervise and make sure that every child's temperature is being done prior to um, going to their classroom? Sure. We have, we have plans in place, again, for this process to occur. We would have to account for that into the entry anyway to our buildings, regardless of the temperature screening devices. Like I said, they're very rapid and um, we hope to quickly move students along. So you only have one device or will it be like four set up or how is that working? It's a one device. We are accounting for the different entry points that our building principals have identified and we will um, ensure as rapid of an entry as possible with as much distancing as, as we can allow for. So the goal is to always maintain that social distancing. Um, like Dr. Martzloff said, it's going to be challenging, but we are going to we already have the parameters in place to account for that. So instead of being done in the classroom, you're going to have hundreds of kids standing outside the door, bunching up against one another with their masks on, waiting to get their wrists checked. And you're going to have one person supervising. What if Johnny has a positive temperature? Who's going to escort him to the nurse's office? Well, this person is supposed to be checking it, you know, 900 other kids. That makes no sense. How, that doesn't sound very efficient. Maybe, yeah. I, maybe, maybe I can't visualize this, but all I can see is one wrist monitor and 500 kids trying to enter the elementary school. Yeah, I, I guess that's the picture you're painting. We see kind of a different process in place for that. And again, we're going to do our best to assure and ensure that there is that social distancing that we know is so crucial. Um, any, any other questions? Oh yeah, I'll keep rolling, don't worry. Um, now my daughter gets speech services, so this might go back to Scott. I'd like to know, you know, the speech teacher has to be able to see the children talk, and obviously she, you know, she or he might get spit on. How are the kids and the staff being protected in, you know, in their room that is not, I'm not even sure if they would stand at each end of the wall is even six feet apart because the room is so small. So how are services, whether it's PT, OT, or speech, um, you know, gonna be safely performed in school? Further to answer that question, so you're better off having individual conversations uh, with people in that department, such as Mr. Scanzuzo, who's one of our assistant superintendents. I, I don't wanna get into too much uh, of answering questions like that, uh, that might, um, you know, violate your own child's uh, confidentiality. So, I'm sorry. So, who should I contact then? Mr. Scanzuzo, one of our assistant superintendents. And can you give me his contact information? Excuse me. And I need his contact information, please. Sure. Six two six eight one six one. Eight one. Or eight zero six one. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Say that again. Six two six. 8061. 8061. Thank you. And I believe my last question is, you said if kids decided to do the hybrid instruction, um, 
instead of going into school, you do not have everything available. What do you not have available? I'm not clear on your question. If they decide to do hybrid instruction, that's what we're offering is hybrid. They right. Could. You said, just so you know, if your child decides to do hybrid instruction, we do not have everything available. That was your own words. I wrote it down. So I wanted to know what exactly is not going to be available to children who decide to do the hybrid version of um, yeah, it's instruction. Not, not hybrid, we're using the word hybrid, and it's really what you're talking about. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I misspoke. Um, if you do the online five right. days a week, what do you not have available? That information is all detailed on WITS. Uh, we just sent a, a WITS mail out to all parents this afternoon, and we would encourage you to look at that and review it. Uh, okay. so you can see what's there and what's not there and uh, make an informed decision on whether or not you want your child to have full online learning or to be part of uh, the hybrid program at school. Okay, uh, last question. If, you, if we have any other questions, because I'm sure some will arise, what is the best way to reach out to get an answer? Because I did actually ask all these questions. I sent an email on that YouTube that was offered but I did not get any response. So I wasn't sure what is going to be um, a more valid way to get a hold to if we have any more questions on returning to school. Yeah, you can certainly contact uh, the principal of uh, your child or children's schools, or you can contact one of the assistant superintendents or myself. Uh, my number is 626-8005. Okay. And, uh, happy to talk to you about any questions that come up. We are also, as I mentioned earlier, doing follow-up meetings uh, next Monday at 6 o'clock for elementary parents, Tuesday at 6 p.m. for middle school parents, Wednesday at 6 p.m. for high school parents, and finally, all employees, teachers, staff members, and administrators on Thursday at 6 p.m. next week. Okay. I, you know, I, I lie. I had one more question. I seen that one of the schools had shields around the desks. Are we going to be providing that at the elementary level? Um, there will be some shields within the district, but not uh, what you're describing in classrooms. Uh, that gets very expensive very quickly uh, for uh, whether or not uh, we want to pursue that. So that's not something we're looking to do right now. Well, I would think that somebody, our child's lives are worth more than it would cost to do that. So I would suggest maybe looking into that. How much are they a shield per desk? We're looking at between a half million and one and a half million dollars per school. All right. Well, I appreciate all your time and effort and stress <laughs> that uh, we are all entailing uh, during this time. And uh, thank you. Stay safe. Stay well. Thank you, Mrs. Ferber. I'm sorry. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, my first question is, uh, you said you randomly selected parents to be on the committee. And uh, how did it, uh, how did that randomness end up with having all, I didn't see anybody of uh, people of color on that committee. We don't, we don't carry information in our internal systems that determine which parents are people of color and which are not. Okay, I mean, uh, how did the randomness happen? Did you have a lottery system or how did you pick it up? How did you pick the parents? I'm sorry, can you repeat that please? Uh, how did you randomly pick up the parents? Did you have a lottery system or did you end up picking up uh, every odd number parent or something like that? How did the randomness happen? Well, we picked them out from, there was about 125 people that volunteered and we took 17 of the 125. 
but i was the first one to apply for it sir i was the first one to send an email on the same day okay and i was not picked for it well um you know we weren't looking to do it by how quickly someone responded we were looking to pick people that represent our community well and that's what we did so are you saying that uh, i am not representing the community well here no i didn't say that i just said we were trying to pick a diverse group of parents excuse But me it... go ahead mm. yes sir no and the a... second yes yeah, second question is uh, you mentioned that the shields are going to cost half a million dollars to a million dollars per school is that right sir no i said a half a million to a million and a half okay million and a half so let me guess uh, please correct me if i'm wrong i'm looking at 10000 students is it right yes. and i'm looking at uh, around 2000 staff members okay okay at uh, each uh, i can tell you a place where you can get uh, 3m shields which are going to cost 30 dollars per person, per shield which are not disposable which can be used for the whole year i'm a dentist and i bought them and i'm using them okay okay just uh, if you're looking at the price but you have to also look at the price for the cost for the life of a child yeah i that think more important that's more important that's what i would say when you make a decision please think about that and my next question yes sir of face shields yes no. sir face shield for 30 dollars which will last them for years that's a different thing than what we're talking about we're talking about shields that go around a desk or around a seating area or around uh you know different desks that staff sit at that's what we're talking about those okay are those shi- those shields will be those shields will be around uh, 60 dollars sir those are plexiglass shields which are molded into the shape will cost around 60 dollars yeah i don't know if that's accurate but i'm not here to debate the cost no 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 okay my next question sir yeah uh when you talk about the fever right depending on uh, i would like to talk to the school nurse because that's her field of expertise and uh, depending on where you take the temperature the temperature will vary is that right ma'am okay when you depending on where you take the temperature on the body the temperature of a person will change will vary depends on whether it's a rectal whether it's a ear whether it's below the tongue whether it's under the armpit whether it's under the it varies you said you're going to Yep, you said you're going to take temperature on the arm for the arteries, right, ma'am? The hands. Okay, hundred degrees is not an accurate temperature when you're going to take it on the arteries. Right, I, I gave the parameters as defined by the New York State Department of Health of what we yep. have in terms of the fever. So that is a screening. That is not a diagnostic in any way measurement. We would do a more thorough assessment with our school nurse okay. with a more accurate temperature. This is a screen, ma'am. The reason why I'm bringing up this topic is CDC is a way behind when it comes to making these regulations. Okay, that's so. I'm just giving an update. Second thing is, is there a reason why we are not checking the oxygen concentration? Because the studies have shown that. people are walking around with covid virus without showing any of these symptoms but they're hypoxic until until new york state department of health or new york state ed puts that into their guidance we would not be conducting that that is not anything that is in literature that we are reviewing and needing to look at in terms of implementing a plan so no no what ma'am what i'm saying is in the dental offices in the medical offices when patients walk in to rule out covid we are taking temperature as well as the uh, oxygen level ma'am okay which is a small instrument which costs like 30 40 correct it is giving out very accurate i know the guidelines say that but the guidelines are changing evolving every day this is my suggestion ma'am this is just a suggestion which will keep our kids safe 
I that's suggestion. And again, next, we will, we will I've got a next, I've got a next question for you, ma'am. I was going through your mandatory assurance plan. It says hand washing should be done with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. It's scrubbing with soap for 20 seconds and then washing with water. That sentence should be changed to scrubbing with soap for 20 seconds and then washing with water. Okay, we can take a look at that again. We're pulling information um, from our resources in order to no. create this plan. So I, I yes. understand that we'll take a look at the wording. Yes, it's very important, ma'am. Washing with, that makes a big difference. Sir, I've got a next question, sir. I mean, my suggestion would be when you buy a thermometer, handheld, non-touch thermometers, a pulse oximeter, which is going to really help in screening kids, it's going to keep our kids safe, ma'am. And uh, second question is, I don't know whether it's your uh, department or not. When it comes to the water fountains, are you guys going to keep the water fountains open or closed? I'll let Mr. Matuski answer that question. New York State Education Department has stated that water fountains cannot be used in schools. Thank As you, result, sir. We will be using water filling stations to fulfill the requirement to provide water to students. And when it comes to the bathrooms, are you guys going to be using uh, touchless uh, water flow systems where people don't have to turn on the taps or touch the anything? No, normal water fa water uh, faucets are in use, and hand washing protocol would apply. Okay, how I read about something about uh, using those uh, air to dry your hands. Are those going to be in function? Okay. All the air hand dryers have been disconnected and will not be used in this school year. Okay, one one more question for you, sir. When it comes to these things, uh, are you going to be using a fogger in the school buildings? No foggers are in use. Uh, is there a reason why you're not using a fogger, sir? They're not. We have, uh, we're following CDC cleaning requirements and we're using the two-step uh, deep cleaning process of cleaning and disinfecting. But uh, according to CDC guidelines, fogger with hypochloric acid is, is used for disinfecting buildings, hospitals, dental clinics. But for the New York State Education Department, it's not a requirement. They recommend us following the so, cleaning and disinfecting, and we're following New York State Education Department as well as CDC requirements for cleaning the school buildings. Sir, sir, my question is, I'm not talking about the requirements, sir. If you go an extra mile to keep our kids safe, because my daughter's health yeah, is based on cleaning procedures, and the fogging is not something that. Um, not just our school district, but most school districts in the area are not considering as an option. Sir, uh, I, I'm just giving you because the cost effectiveness, I'm just saying that it's up to the school district to use it or not, but I'm just giving my suggestion. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Second thing, sir, when it comes, I would like to talk to the superintendent about uh, HIPAA regulations to inform the students. Can I make a small uh, comment about it, sir? Go ahead. Sir, you're not breaking any HIPAA laws when you tell a school or when you tell that somebody has been exposed, so be careful. For example, in the dental offices, if a patient of mine ca calls me back after two days and tells me that I have tested positive, so the next thing for me to do is call all the patients and tell them that a patient of our office has been tested positive, please go and test yourself. I am not breaking any HIPAA laws and the school will not be breaking any HIPAA laws as long as the, uh, the identifying factors, that's like age of the patient or the name, sex, will not be told. You should be able to inform the class, you should be able to inform saying that somebody tested positive. That does not really lead to breaking the, any kind of a loss. Okay, well, thank you for sharing your opinion on that. One more question, sir. Sure. You, I read through the entire booklet and everywhere it says parents or guardians should check their temperatures, sir. What about other family members who are living under the same roof? Other family members who do what? 
who are living under the same roof in the same house but they are not parents they are not guardians or you is the school district telling the family members to check for everybody or just the parents or guardians when it comes to the temperatures i think if you have someone living in your house are they attend are they a student at the school or no they are not student but my daughter comes to school imagine if i have a family members who are not guardians of my daughter or not family members if anyone's coming to school they should be checked out and they should report whether or not they're sick or not okay and about the personal uh, protective equipment are we doing uh, fit fit testing for those uh, masks fit testing is that what you said yes sir yeah we have smaller size masks for example for elementary students no sir that is not the question sir i'm talking about n95 masks for our nurses oh for our nurses yes we are everybody is going to be fit tested our nurses. our nurses are going to be fit tested okay and i just like i said sir every day some new information comes out and that's why i bought about that hypoxia this one and uh, my another question is uh, you said if somebody has tested positive they can come back to school after 10 or 12 days well that depends on our conversation with the Erie County Department of Health and what has taken place but if somebody has tested positive on day 1 and again they can come back on day 12 without getting tested that's what they are uh, a uh, paperwork online said to me sir yeah minimum of 10 days but what if they still have the virus in their body what they still positive yeah that's not the criteria uh, sir i have the criteria here in front of me the picture school protocol for symptomatic or positive covid-19 student or staff contacts to positive case can return to school after 14 <coughs> day quarantine period positive student or staff will be isolated for a minimum of 10 days from start students or staff must be 3 days without a fever and have a progressive improvement in symptoms before returning okay shasha there if you want to send that email that to me that would be helpful i appreciate it thank you for your yes. questions this evening well, we appreciate your time yes, sir i've got few more questions sir okay well we also need to move on we have one number of one people. question one important question for me is uh, i will wait after everybody has answered i mean ask their questions i can wait but this one last question i will still wait after this uh, oh. i want my daughter to get 180 days of school education in a year sir so how are, how are you going to provide my daughter with 180 days of school education i can't Is it early? Julia, if you're there, you need to turn your mute button off, please. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Hi. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I wanted to know if you had considered using a different hybrid model for the elementary schools. Um, for example, doing have the kids in for five half days per week versus two full days. um and part of my um reason or curiosity for that is that i feel that having the kids in the school for less amount of time would be um better for them in terms of being in the school for like 6 hours versus 3 hours that it would be safer for them to come in maybe do the core curriculum courses and then leave as opposed to being there all day and then having to do lunches and going in the bathroom more and also then trying to fit in the extended curriculum courses which i think it would be better to put the extended curriculum courses on the parents responsibility 
um, as opposed to the core curriculum courses. So I was wondering if you considered doing anything different for the elementary students. Well, let me speak to some aspects of your question. Uh, when it comes to having the parents do it for certain courses, um, we can't do that by law. We are mandated by New York State for what we have to teach to which students and how much time we have to teach that to which students. So we can't just say, for example, oh, we don't wanna do physical education. We need our gyms for more classroom space for our students. Um, that won't work for us. Um, when it comes to doing half days, five days a week, that is one that we looked at pretty carefully. And one of the roadblocks to that is with transportation. We have a three-tier transportation system for our 13 schools. So if we were to say, get out of uh, certain schools at 10.30 in the morning, we would need to uh, provide buses to all those schools to take kids home and provide other buses to pick kids up uh, three times uh, during the middle of the day. And it would become very problematic to get all of the students uh, where they need to be on time to receive their education. So that's why we went with the two day a week model. Okay. Um, is there a deadline for when um, teachers or students have to determine whether or not they will come back to school? Um, we're asking for parents to let us know uh, by the end of business next Wednesday, a week from today, whether or not they would like the fully online learning system for their child. And if they do not let us know, then the default for that will be uh, that their child or children will be part of the hybrid uh, system that we have set up. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure what you said for the two days or three days that the children will be home. Again, I'm t really talking relating to the elementary children because I think that that's different. Um, what will be the teacher involvement engagement on those three days that they're home? Well, every Wednesday, there'll be online learning schedule for all students in the district. So that will take place each Wednesday. On the two days that students are not in school, we cannot uh, provide online learning at this time. Um, however, students will have work that they need to complete in order to turn it back into their teacher when they go back to school. So that won't be any kind of online, um, it, it'll be more like homework that they're given. It, it won't be like how they were working in the spring where they were going into different websites to get work. Yeah, that is correct. I mean, they might go on different websites and things, but it will not include direct online instruction uh, from our teachers on those two days that students are at home. Okay, so then in essence, they'll be getting one third of teacher student instruction of what they would normally get. So what is the expectation of where they will be at the end of this year? Will they have completed their grade level curriculum yeah, we're making every effort to do that. Um, I'm not sure where you get one third from. Can you help me understand that? Well, I'm just two out of every five, I don't know, 60 out of 180 days, roughly. Um, and, and I guess to that, what happens if there's a Monday holiday? How does then what happens with the kids that go on Monday, Tuesday? They don't go to school on a holiday. So they miss that one day, and then how does it work for keeping them on track with the kids that are there Thursday, Friday? Well, um, as we go through the year, depending on how long this hybrid program lasts, we may look at that and find other ways to provide additional opportunities for students to come to school, uh, but we're not ready to speak to that yet. Okay, um, then I guess, 
you know, the hope is that if things continue to go well and the cases remain low, is it possible that they could return to school full time at some point this year? That is our goal. If we could do it now for September 8th, we would, but we can't. Um, we're going to continue to work uh, to move in that direction. Like I said, uh, the biggest thing that would allow us to do that is if the guidelines around social distancing were lifted or relaxed. Uh, I don't see that happening until there's a, a viable vaccine for this virus. Scott, uh, this is Marty Hurley. Um, uh, sorry to jump in, but if there's, I've been reading the online program for the full online, it appears like there's, it's saying that there's going to be five days worth of uh, online instruction with daily engagement with teachers. If that's the case, why can't there be online instruction to supplement the in-school instruction for the kids that are staying home on Tuesday and Thursday, or, or you know, the Thursday, Friday, if the other kids are, go, if they're in school Monday, Tuesday? Uh, because we're using different teachers to provide the full-time online instruction. And so that's how we're able to handle that. I, I guess I, with all this time to prepare, it's, I, I don't understand why there wouldn't be a, a supplement of a in-school teacher and an online teacher that work collaboratively together. Well, um, that would be quite a few teachers we would have to hire to be um, online teachers for the days that students are not physically in school. And uh, I don't think that that makes a tremendous amount of sense at this time. I, uh, can you help me explain why it doesn't make sense? Well, let's just pick a number. I'll just use a random number. Let's say it costs us $3 million to do that or 2 million or 5 million or whatever the number is. That's a significant expense that hasn't been budgeted for through last year's budget process. At the same time, uh, once the school year gets underway, Governor Cuomo will be coming out with significant state aid cuts for all school districts in New York State. And ours in Williamsville, we are expecting to be in the eight to $12 million revenue cut range, which leads us even more severely short to be able to provide education to our students. So, you know- Okay, if so if, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I apologize, let me finish. No, go ahead, you're okay. Uh, so the, it appears then that the off home program, the full-time home program offers 180 days or normal daily interaction in teacher-led instruction uh, compared to, like we said, the, the hybrid model with, you know, uh, three days worth of teacher-led instruction. Is that a fair interpretation? I think that's fair, yes. Any other questions? I'm done with that. Um, okay, then I guess just lastly, one comment, my opinion, I think it would be prudent to look into the cost of the death shields because anything that we can do to keep the cases down and keep the children safe, um, we should really look to do. Yeah, we did look into the cost. Like I said, it's gonna be between a half a million and a million and a half dollars per school. So you're looking at, you know, let's just say $15 million for our school district to provide those desk shields. I don't know, you know, what the proof rate is like on those in terms of protecting children and staff, um, but uh, I don't know if that makes sense to do that. Okay, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. I don't want to talk about Hello. Hello, Laura Smith. Hi, how are you? How are you? Good. Um, just a couple of questions. I know with talking with the about the shields, I'm just wondering how the figures are coming up so high. I know Clarence, I directly spoke to someone that works in Clarence. They spent $1 million 
and provided a desk shield for every child in the district, even though they're going hybrid. Um, so I'm just wondering why the numbers are that high um, that you're getting for each school. I don't know. We can go back and look at it again and perhaps uh, look at a different company. There's also different qualities to the different shields, uh, whether or not some of them are constructed out of the right materials. We would want to review that. Um, we just don't want to put anything in place and say, oh, isn't that great? That's so much safer for kids, but then it's really not because it's made out of wax paper or something uh, along those lines. So we would just want to be careful with that. Uh, we will go back, however, and look at it again and see if there's uh, a better way to be able to do this. Um, okay, the, just as a reference, it was bicarbonate um, that they were using there, so it is a good source. But on to the next question. Um, can you tell me again when you have to decide if you're doing full virtual versus hybrid? Uh, Mrs. Smith, we can barely hear you. Can you um, speak more directly, perhaps, into your line? Sorry, can you hear me now? No. Um, I don't know what happened. Let me just try. I don't know. Um, is that any better? Can you guys hear me now? Can barely hear you. What is your question? Um, when do we have to know when we're choosing by online or hybrid again? Uh, that That is due next Wednesday, by the end of the day next Wednesday. And are we letting the principals know that? No, there's a form on WITS that you need to complete if you choose to go with a full online instruction. And once you submit that, then uh, it will take place for you. Okay, and once you choose, can you change your mind? I'm sorry, what about changing your mind? If I choose um, online learning, can I change my mind midway through and send them to school? What do you mean midway through what? Through, are you making parents commit to a certain amount of time if they're choosing virtually lessons? No way or not. So at one point I can say it virtually online and then the next week send my kid to school? Yeah, just don't go back to virtually online or we may never let you out. Okay. I'm just, um, just kidding, Mrs. Smith, just, just joking. I mean, that's not true. I get, I get it. Yeah. Um, and then when are we going to, how many kids are gonna be in each classroom? Uh, that depends on the school, the class, the grade level, the level of the class. That's all over the board. Okay. Um, how can we ensure that parents are not taking on the task of a teacher with these projects or assignments you guys are trying to do opposite days? Because parents are trying to work at home and it's not fair for them to take on the role of teaching and this is coming from, I'm a personal teacher. So I understand what it entails to do both homeschooling and doing your job as a teacher as well. Uh, I don't have a good answer for you on that one or certainly open-minded to listen to your potential solutions, but I'm not looking to monitor parents and what they teach or don't teach their own children. Well, I'm just thinking they can't possibly be teaching children in like a kindergarten. You can't say, go do this assignment by yourself, a parent has to sit there and complete these assignments with these children. Okay. So why aren't we doing more recorded lessons or having teachers on their preps prepare these lessons that can be recorded for students that are virtually learning at home? There's no reason that they're not having interaction with their, with their students every day. Well, the reason is, is if you're teaching, physically teaching kids on Monday and Tuesday, on Wednesday you're doing online uh, instruction and professional development as a teacher. And then on Thursday and Friday, you're teaching uh, physically the kids that are coming in on Thursday and Friday. So I guess my question back to you would be, how would you give online instruction on Thursday and Friday when you're already teaching 
your other half of the students on those two days? I would be pre-recording my lessons on my prep break or the time before and after school, the teachers are required to be there and do work so that these kids are having a live teacher interact with them daily. And like other districts, they're holding a quote unquote academic lab or an extra class where they can come in if needed and talk to teachers. Um, they can talk to teachers when the kids have questions. I think somebody could volunteer to do that, but that's not something the district could mandate from a contractual standpoint. You can't contractually make them have pre-recorded lessons that that's what they're doing on their prep periods? No, I don't think we could, especially if they're already teaching full time. Right, but full time includes prep periods. Yes. That's what you do on your prep is you prepare for the lessons you need to be teaching in the forthcoming days, weeks, whatever. Okay, well, that'd be an interesting one to find out through the grievance process how that would work for a specific teacher or groups of teachers, but I don't think the district would be successful in being able to mandate that. Okay, so how are we taking pressure off of parents then that are still working and can't be at home doing these projects or assignments, homework, whatever we want to call them? I don't think there is a way we're looking to take pressure off of parents. I understand this is not the optimal plan for parents. This is not the optimal plan for the district or for our students. This is not what we want to do. This is what we have to do. If there's a different way or an improved way we could do it, we're certainly open to that. We still have a month to go before school starts. Um, but right now we have not encountered any other option or options that can work uh, to provide that type of relief to our parents. So are kids being held responsible for unfinished work on those days at their home to be left to their own devices? Yes. So how is that equitable? If they're not having a teacher provided to them, how is it equitable that some kids are, they're being held responsible when they don't, aren't actually being taught? Well, it's just like, how is it equitable if one kid turns in his or her homework and one kid doesn't? There's but no, they're in school. There's no teacher at home with them to do their homework with. Right, a lot of schools don't believe in the theory of homework anymore because of that. Well, I'm not going to go down that path, but I'm just saying, you asked the question, um, how is it equitable? And I gave the answer of it's as equitable as homework could be. Okay, so basically Williamsville, unfortunately, is really dropping the ball in this whole process because there's so many parents in this community right now that are so up in arms about what's happening because you guys keep saying, like, we don't know yet. We don't know yet when every other district surrounding us has a plan in place, they have a backup plan and they know what's going on. I don't understand why our district being one of the number one districts is not at least coming up with our own great plan or looking to other districts for direction. Mrs. Smith, our plan is very close to every other school district's plan throughout Erie County. So I'm not sure what you mean that other districts are doing things better or have better plans. Um, we are just as prepared as they are for school to begin. It might not be what everybody wants it to be and provide what everyone wants us to provide, but we're providing what we think is everything that we can given the constraints that we're working under. I don't know. I guess the parents are going to have to work on their own to really figure out how to change this and petition this because other districts are providing systematic instruction for children when they're not in school. Okay. It's very unfortunate the, the outtake that you're taking on all of this and kind of not taking us serious as parents and community members. Mrs. Smith, I'm taking it very serious. I did a presentation on this last night and answered questions. I'm doing the same thing tonight. Four nights next week, I'm doing the same thing. Uh, we've spent all spring and into the summer on this. The facts change every day. Every day the governor does a press conference. He's got a new rule or a new slant on the way things are supposed to work. 
this has been a very serious endeavor for everyone. So I reject that you think that we haven't taken this seriously. I'm sorry you feel that way, but as I'm sitting here, my phone is literally dinging, 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 dinging of all Williamsville parents saying, keep going. You need to say more. This is ridiculous. Why aren't they answering our questions appropriately? Preach. It's very frustrating on our part that this is not coming to terms of where it needs to be. Mrs. Smith, I'm answering your questions. I might just not be giving you the answers you wish to receive. And I wish I could give different answers, but we have to follow the law. We have to follow guidelines and regulations from New York State. We can't just do whatever we feel like doing because it's more convenient for parents and they voted for it. I can't do that. No, and I completely understand that. I'm not saying that I necessarily want my kids into school five days a week. I just want it to be equitable and not when parents are working and we now have tons of latchkey kids going back to, you know, when we were all children, that these kids are going to be able to kind of do this work on their own because they're not going to have the support from parents. What you guys are saying is they're not going to have the support from the teachers on those two days that they're left by themselves. And it's just unfortunate coming from our point of view that we can't do more to step up and I never said they're not gonna have the support of teachers. I did not say that. What I said is teachers will not be providing online instruction for two days a week if they are not in school. That's what I said. And that's just, that's just factual. So, but to say the teacher won't support them, that's incorrect. To say I said parents won't support them, I never said that. Uh, obviously students have lots of support in their lives sometimes from teachers, sometimes from parents, sometimes from grandparents. It depends on um, the student's scenario. So all of those things are gonna help our, our students succeed. Well, I guess we're gonna have to live and learn, unfortunately. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Hello. Anita Martell. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, sure. My question is around um, special education services. So hopefully you'll be able to answer it. Um, my, one, my child and I know many other child, or parents um, have this question because things that have been coming to my phone through Facebook and whatnot. In terms of children receiving services, so for instance, um, my child has um, 15 to one on her IEP for one of her classes, but not all of her classes. So my understanding, according to the reopening plan was that students in 811, 1211 and 15 to one are receiving class every single day, but they are, or excuse me, maybe four days a week, but they are um, students who are in self-contained classes so I'm just trying to get a little understanding of where my daughter and some other children would fall in terms of that service um, being met. Would they be going to school every day if they just receive it for one class, two classes, or would they just be going the two days per week as per their last name? Yeah, Mrs. Martell, it would be two days a week. And the reason being is because your child is not in a full-time special class. And for us, we're trying to provide more supports where we can, and we have to draw the line somewhere. And we decided to draw the line with those students. We have about 162 of them in the district that are in full-time special class scenarios. And those are the students that will receive the additional days of uh, in-school support. Okay, so thank you for answering that part. Now, my other question is for the times that, so if she's in school on Thursday and Friday receiving her services for that class, on the other three days per week, how is that service going to be received so that legally her IEP is followed through with properly? So this is Martel, uh, this is Tony Scandus, the Assistant Superintendent for Exceptional Education. Hi. Well, how you doing? Uh, great question. Uh, 
So what will happen on Wednesday is that your, your, your daughter or your, your child will be receiving services um, from their gen ed teachers as well as a special ed teacher that's assigned to, uh, assigned to them. And they will be providing them the additional supports uh, digitally uh, at home. And we're looking to build in uh, additional supports on the days that uh, your child is home on, say Monday and Tuesday, if your daughter's in that, uh, in that bracket. So having said that, we're looking to uh, internally build in a system that provides supports for special education students um, that are not in session face-to-face -face on the days that they're off. And uh, we're still kind of in the, in the fine tuning of that process. We seem to have it pretty much set, uh, we believe at the elementary level. And uh, we're just looking to finalize that plan for middle and high as well. Okay, thank you. I wondered too, thank you for answering that. I appreciate it. Well, in terms of um, teletherapy, is that option going to be there again? So that speech services, if they weren't received, like if they go to school on Thursday and Friday, if they don't get speech at school, that they would be able to get it via Zoom services like this past school year? That service will be intact. So for students that are not in session, and if they have to have a service three times a week, uh, Maybe perhaps two of them could be done face to face and one will be done uh, digitally. Okay. Um, and I know my husband has a question, but I just have one last quick question. Um, since specially designed instruction is per part um, 200 regulations for the state, what kind of guidance are we going to receive as parents to make sure that we're giving our children who have IEPs that we're making sure that we follow through in the best way possible um, to what the teacher is doing at school so that there's some consistency between home and school. So we'll provide, we'll provide supports, like I said, uh, internally here that are gonna assist parents at home. Um, it's, uh, I can tell you right now that, you know, we, we got this, this guidance from our attorneys that it's virtually impossible in a remote or hybrid setting to uh, man a student's IEP to the letter of the law. Right. Uh, we will do what we can uh, to, the, to the extent possible uh, in progress monitor. And we hope that with consistent communication between you know, teachers and parents, um, and we can talk about um, you know, any flexibility that we have in our schedules to provide you know, additional services or whatever we can be creative with, to ensure that those students don't fall behind, that are not progressing uh, appropriately towards their goals, um, that we will, we will work to, uh, to, to remedy those situations as they happen. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. My husband has a question. Yeah, just one question. I, um, a parent had asked earlier as far as how will the district make sure that our children are getting 180 days of education as mandated? Is, I think the response was the district can't. Can we get a little more clarification on that and the impact from the state level? You know, will that affect, you know, how that how will that affect funding? How will that affect our children's education and into next year? Just more clarification on, on, on the can't part. Yeah, we don't know yet. We are inquiring with the state and the state education department about that. Um, I can't see how we would be somehow adversely affected by having fewer days is if they're going to do that to us, they'll have to do it to just about every school district, uh, at least in Western and Central New York, based on just the data I've seen um, where different uh, school districts are going with a hybrid model. Okay, thanks. I don't want to take anyone else's time up. So thank you for the answer. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello? Well, who is this? Hi, uh, this is Elena Pop. Can you hear me? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. What is your name? Can you hear me? Yes, what is your name? Hi, my name is Elena. 
Can you hear me? What is your last name, Milena? Uh, Pop, P-O-P. I have a couple of questions regarding the online uh, um, learning. Um, so I, I looked briefly over the uh, email that was sent uh, this afternoon, and um, I was wondering if uh, if the teachers are going to be uh, the, the teachers that are currently teaching in the school uh, that are going to do the online learning, or if the teachers are, gi are giving the option to choose if they, they want to do in class or um, online. Can you repeat your question, please? I'm sorry, I'm trying to follow along exactly what you're trying to ask. So I'm trying to ask if uh, the teachers that are gonna be for the full online um, module, if they are uh, teachers that are currently teaching in the school or that are the, uh, you are gonna hire brand new teachers to do that. I, I can't speak accurately to that yet because there may be teachers that decide uh, they're too sick or have uh, too many challenges uh, to their immune system to come back to school. So our first effort is gonna to be to making sure all of our physical classes are staffed. And then after that, take care of our online classes. So our goal will to have them be current teachers if not, we may have to hire some part-time individuals to help with online teaching. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so for the online uh, program, are they gonna have a schedule for every single day? Yes, there should be a schedule for every single day. And uh, let's say that, um, you are going to hire new teachers. Are, uh, are, are these teachers uh, going to be experienced with that particular grade level or um, it can be like somebody uh, fresh out, of, out from the school? Uh, we don't know yet. Whenever we hire someone for any job, we want the best person with the best experience, knowledge and abilities. And that's what we would look to do here. All right, and the last question, so I let other people um, um, ask questions. Um, I, actually, I think this is it, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Hello. Hello, Melissa May. Yep, yeah, that would be me. <laughs> Hope everybody's doing well. Um, I really do honestly gotta have a few questions. I'm not gonna overwhelm everybody. Um, my first question is when will you know what the total number of kids that are gonna be in school compared to doing solely online? Um, that's a great question. We would have a good first look at that um, a week from tomorrow, once we know how many students are going full-time online. But then you have to also take into account that uh, at the end of every August, there's families that move in and there's families that move out. There might be families decide that, uh, that decide to go with home learning at that time, uh, whatever the case may be. So we're probably not gonna know until right before the first day of school. Okay. So with that aspect and not trying to sound a little presumptuous, if you have more people that are going to say, I'm just going to send my kids to the online, are you going to be able to adjust to the having the less kids in the classroom to maybe do a three day a week or possibly a little bit longer? Are you asking if there's fewer kids in physical school, would we consider using that type of data to perhaps have our kids physically in school more days during the week? Yes. Yeah, that is a possibility. However, there's one problem with that. And the problem- so That they would change come August or September. Exactly, and they'll say, I want my kid back in school full time. I'm switching out of this online learning coming back to school, now we've got full classes, full days, going to school every day, and we're right back to where we tried to avoid being. Right, okay. Um, 
in terms of grading scales from the online, full online BOCES to what the kids are going to do now from the two days, three off, um, how is that going to work? Because I'm assuming the BOCES school, they're going to literally have a teacher with them every single day. Online here for hybrid, you're only going to have a teacher two days a week and they're going to do everything three days a week on their own. Or, yeah. Yeah, that's going to be worked on by our committee. Uh, okay. Right now is finalizing how much time a student should be online, how much time a teacher should be online, things of that nature. Okay. And then also, please know um, you used the word BOCES a couple times. We're looking to do the program with existing Williamsville teachers, and oh. we are most likely not going to use BOCES this year. Oh, okay. I think I, I thought I saw that on the plan, so I thought that's what that was. It's not a problem. Um, yeah. My last question is, is in terms of quizzes and tests that these kids would be taking normally in the schools, how is that going to change? Because I know a lot of IEPs have it where you don't take tests on computers. It has to be a physical piece of paper um, test. You want to have the kids there to be able to show the teachers that they're not doing anything crazy. How is that going to work? Yeah, what we will probably try to do is have any tests or assessments done while students are physically in class. Okay, so then the learning aspect would just kind of be the three days at their home um, with the online then. Or are you going to try to cut down on some of the tests and quiz quizzes that would possibly come to try to get more of the learning in because they're going to not be in class as much as before? Yeah, I wouldn't want to make any promises on that. I think we're going to try to do what makes the most sense for our students. We also okay. don't want students in school two days a week taking tests all day either. Correct. Um, but we do want to use that time wisely and uh, for our assessments. Okay. Now, I know some, I don't think anybody's brought this up yet, but in terms of the busing wise, how is, do you have any information on that yet? Or are we still kind of in a holding pattern? For busing? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to be doing a survey with parents on busing very soon. Okay. Uh, along with a survey on technology, we want to make sure students have access to a device uh, for technology. And so uh, that information will be shared with parents um, so that we can collect it and, and make uh, decisions going forward. Okay. Um, I think that's all the questions I really had. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, Kara. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. So uh, I have a I have a couple questions. I, I think that the August 19th date to make a decision is is very fast when most of the answers to the questions that are being asked are we don't know yet. I don't know how to make an informed, educated decision when there are so many unanswered questions. So if after August 19th, I decide I want my children to be 100% remote, how do I go about that? Well, you could call the district and we could see if there are openings and if that could happen. Okay. My other question, I looked at the list. I got the uh, list of what will be included in the 100% remote. I got it about 20 minutes before this meeting and I looked at it. And the accelerated math program that my son has been recommended for in seventh grade is not available with 100% remote. And so my question is, how is that equal education under the law? Frank, can you turn that off? How is that equal education under the law that I have to choose between my son getting a class he's been recommended for and going to school. I can't have both. I can't have him do 100% virtual and still get all the accelerated programs he's been recommended for. How is that equal education? Hi, Mrs. Castalia. This is my assistant superintendent for instruction. Um, just to clarify, what class specifically? The math accelerated for seventh grade. I see the advanced math is being offered, but not the accelerated math, which is the higher. I don't know that the terminology makes a difference. The intent there was that those levels of math would be 
Um, so we can go back and see how it's reflected, but those classes for 7A, as they're often called, would be would be offered. So both advanced levels would be offered? What? Okay, thank you. That answers that question. My other question is, you know, under the law, these kids are entitled to meaningful teacher interaction every single day, even with a hybrid or virtual remote learning. So if there is no student teacher interaction on Thursdays and Fridays, how is that under the law following the New York State guidelines? I think we're talking about two different models. So the first model you referenced was the 100% remote option. With the, hy with the hybrid. If they're not having any interaction with teachers twice a week, how is that fulfilling the New York State requirement under the law? As New York State defines it, they actually incorporate several opportunities whereby teachers could actually um, incorporate other strategies to reach out to their students. Someone mentioned videos earlier. Um, not all of that is completely face-to-face. -face. So if you look at the guidance, they actually give a pretty robust um, set of descriptions in the later pages in the New York State guidance to indicate that that can happen in a variety of ways. Uh, what our committees are doing now is ensuring that all of those examples of how the interaction could look are actually known to teachers so that they can take advantage of a variety of ways to reach out to their students. Face-to-face -face is just one of those methods that's used. Right, but, but the superintendent just said there will be zero reaching out on Thursdays and Fridays if they're not in school, that they'll just be given assignments to do at home. He said that no online learning would be provided. There's a distinction between the direct online teaching, which I believe the question was related to the face-to-face -face interaction, which is different than other opportunities whereby teachers reach out to students. That can be done digitally, it can be recorded. There are other ways that the interaction could look. There may be office hours, there may be reaching so, out. Um, I guess that's my question. What will be provided on those days that the students are not in school? It could, it could be any and all of those. But specifically, what will Williamsville be providing? How can we make a decision if we don't know what will be provided? I believe I already answered the question. I'm not sure how to answer that. We, we have 900 teachers. Those are all options for provision. It is not a oh. one delivery model. It is so, all so it will be up to the teacher as to how they reach out to the kids on Thursdays and Fridays? Any of those examples? included that I just mentioned as reflected in the guidance count towards the substantive interaction. So any of those would be valuable interactions that are counted under the guidance. Right, so what I'm asking is, will it be up to the teacher to choose what interaction they have when the kids are not in school? They have to choose from the list of provided acceptable options that New York State provides. Okay, and they'll, so on Wednesdays when they have to do these remote learning lessons on Wednesdays, if a child is in daycare and the daycare refuses to allow them to use a computer, or if a child is being babysat by a 12 year old who doesn't, isn't able to help them, what can a parent who works do? I would encourage the parent to reach out to the building principal or myself and we will try to assist as best we can. I, we don't govern the way daycares run their programs, but we do everything in our power to make sure that the students have the interaction necessary. And what I'm hearing is if they can't, if they can't be online Wednesday, if they can't do the work on Thursday and Friday, they will be penalized. I think that's a very strong word to use. I think the issue that someone brought up earlier was the issue of accountability and providing outcomes for students. Our, our goal is not to punish students or families. Our goal is to work with students and families. So again, we would encourage if anyone has challenges, we would try to really work through those in partnership with them. But there are things in daycares and other places that unfortunately we're not able to control for. We just wanna make sure that we're able to partner with you or families as needed to be able to provide supports. There are other ways to access material. One of them is through um, screencasts or videotaping, which we again, have a bit the ability to do in our district and many of our district district teachers already use those methods. So um, we realize part of the challenge with the live teaching will be access and we will do everything we can to work with the families should that be uh, brought to us as a, as a problem or an issue for them. Well, you know, it will 100% be an issue in my life because we are a two working family uh, and I have four children, one starting kindergarten and my 12 year old will not be responsible to make sure my kindergartner is sitting in front of a computer and doing Wednesday lessons. It's just not gonna work while I'm in court. It, it just won't work. 
And my concern is that this is not equitable education. And my children will go to school on Monday and Tuesday. So once a month, when there's a Monday holiday, which there is almost every single month, a Monday holiday, my children will be one less day in school than the end of the alphabet. So I don't know how all of this is going to be addressed. And the answers to the, all of these questions are really not answers. They are, we're figuring it out. We're working on it, which I can appreciate. This is a difficult situation for everyone. And I appreciate that. But I think we need more determinative answers before we can make a decision on what level of education or which level of education we're going to choose, remote or hybrid. Because I can't make an educated decision without the answer to these questions, especially for a kindergartner and someone going into an accelerated program. I just don't see any answers to my questions. Um, my, you know, more practical questions, the plastic dividers, Clarence did it, Grand Island did it. They're $36 a divider. I have that information if the superintendent would like it. As far as temperatures being taken, are you asking me before I go to work and get my kids on the bus to take four temperatures and go on to WITS to answer an online survey and enter their temperatures every single day for four students? Not going to happen. No offense, not going to happen. I don't have time in the morning to do that. It's not going to happen. And I can guarantee there are other parents that feel the same way. So unless you're going to take the student's temperature when they come into school, you're not going to know if they have a fever. Well, a we are going to take their temperature. And, and Carol, like we said, everybody's going to have new responsibilities that we're asking people to take part in so that we're protecting all children and all staff and keeping people as healthy and safe as possible. And if you're not willing to do that or other parents aren't willing to do that, that's certainly your choice. And you I'm just saying it's a lot on parents who are trying to get four kids out the door and get to work to take a temperature, go online, enter in quite, because the questions I'm assuming are the same questions you get asked like when you go to a, a, when you go anywhere, have you been exposed? Have you been out of New York state? Have you been, if we have to check all those boxes for four individual kids and enter a temperature every single day, that is difficult. That's all I'm saying is it's difficult. I'm not saying that it's impossible, but it, it's, it's none of this is easy. And I just don't get the feel. It's just, it's difficult. It's difficult. And, and I just feel like, and I know you disagree with me, but I feel like other schools have more solid plans. Um, my other question is, do, uh, if the, the virtual teaching, if you're 100% remote, are they a teacher from your specific school or are they just a teacher from the district? Yeah, we already talked about that one earlier in the conversation. I'm uh, sorry, I don't remember the answer. We, we hope that they would be an existing teacher, uh, but okay. there may be situations given the staffing challenges that we uh, may have at the beginning of the school year where we need to hire new teachers in order to do this work. Uh, so we're not sure yet. Um, but our goal is to have it be uh, existing personnel. Okay. And again, uh, you know, the only question I, I think that I'd like an answer to is the Monday holidays. How will those days be made up for the individual's kids who, who happen to be at the beginning of the alphabet? Because once a month, we will have one less day of instruction when they're already only going two days a week. Well, I think you could make, you know, not to sound ridiculous, but during a normal school year, all of our students miss the Monday holidays. So what's yes, being- but, Yes, that? but well, now only half the students will be. Okay, then we're going to have to find a different way to try to provide additional support and services to those students. It, and that's, that's what I'm asking. How are you going to do that? Yeah. Or maybe, I guess I'm just throwing it out there as I expect, I, I do expect something additional for that. Okay, well, we may decide to do it on a Wednesday. We may decide to offer some support on a Saturday. Um, none of that is finalized yet, um, but we will look to provide additional support where we can to make sure that uh, our students are given uh, the support that they deserve. I, I, I hope so, because, you know, I'm proud to be a Williamsville parent, or at least I was. And, and I, this when the spring remote learning came in, you know, I, my, my daughters who were in third grade went five weeks without any instruction. They were given recommended websites 
to go on and told, read a book and summarize it to your parents. It wasn't until school was finally canceled for good where I, they started to get new work and remote instruction. And I do not blame the teachers because they did a wonderful job. But there were five weeks where my kids had no instruction, none, zero. And so I just hope that this is a little better than it was. Sarah, let me ask you a question. Sure. What, what do you mean you don't blame the teachers? The teacher didn't give your kids any assignment for five weeks, but you don't blame the teacher? Well, Who do you blame? They, the district, the school, I blame the administration. I think that they should have been more specific with what the teachers were meant to do. I don't think that they, they were, to, from my information, they were told ju just, we're going to be back, give them just some things to keep them occupied. Does that make any logical, rational sense to you? It does not. It does not at all, which is why it frustrated me. Then why do you believe it? I guess I'm taking their word for it. It could be argued either way. Whose word for what? The teachers I spoke to. Okay, so when you talked to your child's teacher, you said your child was in third grade or fourth grade? Third. And you third grade, and you said, we haven't had any work for five weeks. What? And the response from the teacher was, nobody told us to give work? Or No, the response was, this is the guidance we've gotten from administration of, as to what we can do. That's, I, I'm sorry, that happened to you? Did you contact your child's principal? Yes. Okay, and what did that person say? That now that school was canceled per permanently, there would be more online instruction and there were slides given after that point and more online teaching. Okay. All right, well, I hope going forward, you'll stay in touch with us and let us know if you're experiencing these kinds of issues because no one would tell a teacher not to communicate with parents. Oh, they were communicating. There just was no new work. No new work. That's just as good as not communicating. No, no new work is just as good as saying nothing. It's the same thing. Well, also accountability. My kids didn't have to turn in one inkling of work, not one, and they knew it. So how do, you know, they did not look at them to say, are you on track? Are you keeping up with the math work? Are you keeping up? We didn't have to hand anything in. I don't know how these teachers knew whether the kids were succeeding or not. You wouldn't know. How would you know? Right. Our school did not require anything to be turned in whatsoever, period. Okay. That's an issue. That is an issue. The middle school, they did. Middle school, my son was held accountable. He had assignments. He had consistent uh, grading. He had to turn his assignments in. Elementary school, not one piece of anything was required to be turned in at so, all. When you talk to the elementary teacher, did you tell the elementary teacher, why are you telling me this about what the district is telling you to do and not do when the middle school is, is holding my child accountable for producing work? Uh, no, I, I was too overwhelmed with getting four kids through the rest of the year. Okay. Do you have any additional questions? No, that was it. I, you know, I just, it, there's just a lot of concerns to be able to make a decision informed by next week. I understand this is very stressful on everyone and is certainly not an ideal situation or an ideal scenario, and we are all doing the best we can to navigate it. So thank you for your continued patience. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yeah, Joel Lefevre. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, so do you know anything about the vaccine? Is that going to be mandated by uh, the school district when that comes out by chance? That mandate would not come from a school district. It would come from New York State and or through the federal government. Um, I would make an assumption that it will be mandated once it's available. Uh -huh. And if I refuse the vaccine for my children? It would be similar to what happens if you refuse current vaccines that are mandated. Uh, okay, that's interesting. Um, 
also, is, is there going to be some kind of start time for the online schooling, or is that basically at our leisure? I'm sorry, some kind of what time? Start time. Yeah, start the, um, yeah there's a calendar and a schedule uh, that will be available to uh, those families uh, that choose full-time online learning. Okay, so there'll be, uh, the kids will go online at the same time every day and then do their curriculum or whatnot. Yeah, well, it'll be dependent on level. So, you know, it might be different between elementary, middle school, and high school. But for the most part, yes, they will go online at certain times. Okay, um, I, I guess I have comments. Uh, I pretty much agree with uh, uh, Laura Smith on basically everything she said. Um, the online learning, I'm not a teacher. Um, I, uh, you know, that's not my wheelhouse. I wasn't uh, trained in that. So I just, my comment is, as when the teachers make the curriculum up for, the, for my children, I would like them to keep that in mind and that, you know, it, it, it should be streamlined, not multiple websites with multiple passwords with all these assignments. It's like, basically, I was my kid's advocate um, and I had to, you know, uh, I was getting several emails from different teachers about whose assignment got dropped or who didn't hit turn in what. And uh, it was completely chaotic. And my kids were only doing like one and a half to two hours with the schoolwork a day. So I don't think they really learned all that much. You know, considering how much I pay in taxes for Williamsville, I expect that the curriculum to be streamlined, easy for the parents and educational for my children with a, a proper amount of instruction included. So that's my comment for that. Hi, Mr. LeFever, it's Marie Bailyn again. I, I just wanted to address a couple of items um, for you. As far as the streamlining, teachers and our district staff have been working diligently to uh, review and revise the curriculum as needed. As far as the streamlining is concerned, that's been a very concerted effort purposefully um, involved in this work. One of the things that I think um, and I hope that parents will be pleased to see is there will be a landing page for every um, at the elementary, it will be grade level at middle school and high school, it would either be team or individual. So you will see at a, at a glance what is due and upcoming for the week. So we are hoping to uh, minimize, you know, the searching for information, having a landing page serves a beautiful purpose and being able to go to one place and see what's coming up for the week. So that coupled with our, our Google Classroom, I think will actually help um, support parents and students in making sure that they know what's upcoming for that particular week of instruction. Yeah, it was just, uh, it was really, really hard. And I, uh, I don't look forward to this at all. I'm, and I'm sure there's a lot of parents that feel exactly the same way because I had to shift my schedule and work nights now to get my kids to make sure they get their work done during the day, you know. Um, but another, another quick question that I have is, what happens if one student has uh, uh, coronavirus uh, and what happens to the school? Are, is it shut down for two weeks or um, is it just the class that the kid was in shut down for two weeks or what's the guidelines far, as far as that goes? I think we're going to have to pass you over to, to Mrs. Harding. Thank you. Yes. Hi, how are you? Hi, well, thank you. Good question. We touched upon this a little bit earlier. If there is a COVID positive individual we would work closely with the Department of Health, the local Department of Health, to assist them with their case investigation and contact tracing. So that is a standard practice of ours within the district. Um, we do that with other reportable contagious diseases. We have a strong relationship with the Erie County Department of Health. And we would, again, help uh, with that contact investigation and contact tracing. What that means is that we would see with the Department of Health, and I will read to you their definition of a contact, um, what a contact is, a close contact to an infected individual, is defined by the ECDOH as any individual who is within six feet of an infected person for at least 10 minutes starting from 48 hours before illness onset or for asymptomatic individuals, it's two days prior to a positive specimen collection. 
So that's what they would be looking for in terms of who that contact, who those contacts are to that person, whether it was inside of school, outside of school. So we will look and work with the health department to help identify. And then those uh, individuals would meet the definition for needing to go into quarantine. So the infected person, the COVID positive person would go into an isolation protocol. And then with respect to notification, because this was touched upon earlier, with any contagious disease, a parent mentioned strep throat letters, pertussis letters, head lice letters, we have a notification process in place. We would work with the health department to maintain confidentiality and be able to notify as appropriate. But anybody who needed to be specifically notified as it impacted them directly, meaning their child or another individual had to go into quarantine, they would be notified by us with the Department of Health so that they are alerted as to how that affected individual impacted them directly. Yeah, okay. So what is the quarantine period if say there's been an exposure to a child? 10 days, something like that? So if the Department of Health identifies based on that definition I read to you, if people are meeting that definition as a close contact, then what happens is they are asked to quarantine for 14 days. Okay. On their last exposure. Yeah, see, if, if that quarantine happens to one of my kids, that means that I have to bank negative for two weeks on my vacation time next year, which graciously my company has offered me to do that as a preventive measure. So if that happens to me, I'm not coming back. My kids aren't coming back to the school. At, at that point, are we able to go fully online? So, so I'm gonna back up a minute too. I, I just think what's really important for people to understand is that the best case scenario with all of these strategies that are put into place with social distancing of six feet or more being the most important factor, if those measures are taken at home too, there's, there, is, there has to be a joint effort between the school and families with respect to what goes on outside of the school day. If the health department identifies a positive case that individual ideally best case scenario would be the only one that would need to go into isolation. We don't know though what that will look like until the case investigation is conducted. So that is the best case scenario. And then other people would not need to be quarantined. So that is why social distancing and why we are really in a hybrid model at this point in time. It's actually to ensure the safety of everyone and to hopefully allow for the continuation of schooling to occur so that we're not putting people in and out of quarantine, so that we are able to function and maintain six feet of distance through this hybrid model. So the goal is to actually keep the schools open longer with those parameters being followed. And those are right. mitigating factors that are practiced day, every day with our new norm out in the community and also in school. Right. Okay. So I have two kids in the Williamsville district. Now, if, you know, if one of them, uh, God forbid, you know, gets the coronavirus and I have to quarantine with them for two weeks, I'm not coming back to your school. I'm sorry. Cause like, I can't afford to, to have somebody else get sick down the road. You know, maybe my daughter or something Then I have to quarantine again or some other exposure from a different student to an adult. You, do you know what I mean? It gets kind of crazy here. What, what is the option for going online? Can, if, if I have to pull my kids out because I can't support them because of all these, you know, quarantines and COVID exposures, and I'm talking worst case scenario here, you know, I can, I can switch my kids to the online, right? Is that instant? Can I do that immediately? Yes, I will have Dr. Balin answer that question for you. Hi again, Mr. LeFever. Yes, you may. You may switch them. As Dr. Marksoff indicated earlier, families are able to choose the pathway that best um, under the given circumstances and challenges. Um, if that change is something you, you would desire for your family, you absolutely can make it. Right, okay. Uh, oh, thank you all for your time. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'm gonna answer some of the email uh, questions that have come in. 
Uh, so we're going to take a break from uh, people with live questions. And uh, the first question was, would, will the start of school be impacted because the Board of Education delayed a vote to adopt the reopening plan? And the answer to that question is no. The reason why the Board of Education delayed their vote was because there were changes in the requirements for the plan. So we need to change our plan uh, and make adjustments to the plan going forward so that the board can adopt it uh, prior to school beginning. Uh, the next question is, what's the difference between the mandatory assurances and the reopening plan? Are they the same? Uh, as of right now, they are the same. However, we are looking at making uh, reopening plans um, with more narrative in them to help explain better what's going to happen at each of our schools and some of the adjustments that we're making and provide those to our community as soon as possible. Uh, how did the district not submit its plan to the New York State Department of Health? Um, we uh, neglected to do that. However, we fixed that as soon as we became aware of it. Uh, we were not emailed, we were not given a phone call. Uh, no one contacted us to let us know this uh, until a press release was sent from the governor's office. Uh, why didn't our school district participate in the Erie County survey with other school districts? Uh, I think I've addressed this before in Wits Mails to Parents, but we essentially wanted to do our own survey uh, just with our own parents to get information uh, for our own decision making. Uh, some other questions. Based on the metrics used by the state to determine whether schools can open, why can't school return to full-time in-person instruction five days a week? Uh, I think I've addressed this one tonight in that we are required by law to maintain social distancing as much as possible of six feet or more. Uh, so we intend to do that. Are students required to commit for a predetermined amount of time for hybrid versus online instruction? Uh, no, they are not. Um, the next question, will school day hours remain the same in the hybrid instructional model? The answer to that is yes, the hours for school will remain the same. Uh, the next few questions are on groups A, B, C, and D. And I've explained who's in those groups. Um, so let me keep going here. Will Chromebooks be available to students and staff that need them? Uh, yes, we have a plan in place to provide Chromebooks to all students and staff who need them. And the next question after that is, will mobile hotspots be available to students and staff that need them? We have pursued a plan to provide this, uh, as there may be some families that uh, need some assistance with this. So if that happens to you, please feel free to call the district technology department for assistance. Um, what does instruction look like for students who are in the online instructional model, K-6 or 7-12? Um, that's just being developed as we have just decided uh, what model we're going with. And we are putting that together as we speak. Um, let's see, I'm trying to find other ones. What is happening with athletics? Athletics is not uh, beginning until at least September 21st. If I had to make a rational prediction, I would predict that uh, the idea of having athletics um, this school year, um, the possibility for that is low. Um, how many students will be allowed on the bus? It depends on our surveys. Um, will there be more pickup? drop-off times, that's possible. We may, might make some changes to that. Um, how will student drop-off be completed if they're driven by their parents? We're working with each school to provide uh, additional opportunities for drop-off and pick-up to try to make it as smooth uh, as possible. Clarification on the mask to be worn all day. They are expected to be worn all day. However, we will build in mask breaks um, it's important to note the mask breaks should be consistent um, across the school and really across the district. 
Um, what happens if the student arrives at school with COVID-19 symptoms? Uh, we're gonna bring that student to the nurse in an isolation room and do a further assessment and communicate with parents. Um, will the district provide PPE to students and staff? Uh, yes, we will to the extent necessary. That will include masks and uh, potentially some face shields for some students and some uh, staff members. Um, will any special mask considerations be made for special education students? Uh, that would be on a highly individualized basis. We've been told by the Erie County Department of Health that all students should be able to wear masks. Are the air ventilation systems of each school capable of properly filtering the air? Uh, yes, we believe so. We do have air ventilation systems in all of our schools, and we believe they properly filter the air. You may have read or seen on the news of special filters at malls and other locations we're looking into. Uh, if we were to install those types of filters on our air handling units, uh, either the filters and or the air handling units would not function properly. Um, repercussions for student staff who don't follow the health and safety rules put into place by the district. I would think this is one of the most important things we all need to reinforce. We need to build a culture here where students and staff do follow these rules that help the health and safety of all students and staff. If they don't, then that will be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis and could include uh, student discipline or follow up with uh, employees. Um, what will the cleaning protocol look like on days when students are in school? Um, that will mostly take place in the evening. We will try to clean certain parts of our school throughout the day as much as we possibly can. Uh, what is the protocol for meals? We're still gonna use our cafeterias. There may be times when students are able to eat in their classroom, uh, which we think is good for social distancing. Are safety drills still going to be conducted and completed on the hybrid remote model? Uh, the answer to that question is yes. And during those safety drills, we will need to work to enforce uh, social distancing uh, throughout our safety drills. Um, Will visitors be allowed in the building? If so, are they allowed to go to their child's classroom or are they restricted to the foyer main office area? Um, we are going to severely limit the number of visitors to our schools. We do not want uh, additional individuals in our schools that could potentially spread a virus um, in our schools. So we're gonna ask parents not to bring their children into the school or to a classroom. I know that will be another responsibility change that is uh, perhaps challenging, uh, but we need to do it uh, for everyone's health and safety. So those are some of the emailed in questions uh, that came into email address contact at williamsville 12org I would encourage people to send in more questions that we can address next week at our continued uh, public forums. So at this time, we'll go back to uh, hearing questions from individuals who are part of our meeting. Patrick Bolin. Yes, hello. Thank you. Um, you had mentioned that you had addressed or identified what students are in each group. So maybe I, I missed it, but um, I wasn't clear on what students fall into group B. Sorry, group B, did you say? Group D as in dog. Oh, D, those are students who are, what? Yeah, in a district special class, an 811, um, a 1211 or a 1511. Uh, those students, there's about 162 of them in the district are part of group D. Okay, so these would be students in need of special education? Correct. This is, okay. Um, and then uh, a question on the, uh, for groups A and B, how is it going? So for the teacher assignments, what if 
you know, your child is assigned to a class and it's not an equitable 50% split between who's in A to L and M through Z, uh, or are, are those teacher assignments not done yet and being determined based off of uh, um, this 50% split of, so there's 11 kids per two day course. Yeah, I think we have some, some scenarios where that happens. We've given our principals the authority uh, to make changes that make sense. What we want to stay away from, however, is, you know, my child is really good friends with this other child. So instead of Thursday, Friday, could they go to school Monday and Tuesday? And we don't want to get into making changes for those types of reasons. They'd be more like uh, perhaps you have two children in your household with different last names and you want them to all go to school on the same day, uh, we have no problem with making that adjustment. So if there are some adjustments that make sense, we will certainly do those. And how would we request those type of adjustments? Reach out to the school principal or? That's exactly right. You would make a call to the school principal and make that request and they okay. would evaluate that. So uh, it, uh, on, on to piggyback off of that, that question, <coughs> um, what if there are other neighborhood children that it would be advantageous to parents that are working for their children to go to school on the same days? Is there any chance of having a change in that occurring to where all say four students to, from two different households, one group falls in Monday, Tuesday, the other two students fall in Tuesday, Thursday or Thursday, Friday could they be put together on the same day for daycare purposes where parents can share the responsibility of educating or taking time off of their work days? Again, I, for this one, I don't wanna speak for the principals. It's up to the individual principal. Um, I think we could get into a lot of different examples and I don't wanna sure. split hairs and predetermine what their answer should be. Okay, so again, reach out to the principal with these specific questions. Yes or a possibility. Okay. Um, and for the, the online schooling is, uh, you know, for the two online days or the two non in school days, is it going to mirror what we had in September where it was apps and some lessons assigned or suggested for the students to take, or you're mentioning there, will there be more teacher uh, led instruction? Uh, it should be more teacher-led instruction. Um, and we've done a lot of professional development with our staff because let's face it, if people start getting sick again in Western New York and we have to close schools again, everybody will be back to online anyway at some juncture this school year. Sure, so we have to be ready. Okay. Well, those are all the questions that I can think of right now. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Hello. Hello, Nicole. Hi, how are you? Thank you for taking my question. Sure. So, um, I just wanted some clarification earlier on in the conversation you had said if students were doing the hybrid schedule and then decided to go to the 100% remote that, that you would have to see if there were openings is, and then the, uh, we just had a, a different response that yes, we could then go to the other model. Could you just give some clarification on that? Yeah, um, you know, I think the idea would be to support going to the other model but we do need to make sure that there's space. We can't, you know, if there's already 50 kids in a specific online course, you know, we might have to look at that carefully and split up the courses first or something along those lines. So it might take a little bit of time, uh, but we will certainly make the efforts to make that move. Okay, because I know for personally myself, I have three children in different schools and obviously all three children are different and have heard different things and have, you know, they have their own idea of whether they should go back or not. Some of them are old enough to kind of make that decision. So I, um, I want to look at the social emotional effects of my kids, but if one of them gets in there and is like, holy crap, I cannot do this anymore. 
Um, I, it's too much for me. One of my students have ADHD. So how will be in a seat with a mask? Um, that might be difficult. I just want to make sure they could transition back to the other model. My next question, and I know we've just discussed this in the CDC and what they recommend if a child test positive for COVID. And I know that you have to follow the protocol uh, guidelines that are given to you. Um, if you could just speak again to the thoughts of being in a school, and I know ideally we wanna stay six feet apart and all of those, those things, but are, do you guys have any control over like, okay, we have five kids that tested COVID positive, our school has to shut down. Is that in your control at all or is that completely out of your control? No, it's in our control. Okay. Any thoughts on what moving forward, if that were to happen in one of your schools, you know, at North High School, five kids test positive or staff members, what, um, what level at which are you, the bar are you willing to take it to, I guess, for lack of a better word? I think that's a difficult question and that every situation is different. Okay. Whether it's five kids or 10 kids or who exactly is sick or how they got sick or how long they were in contact with people. There's a lot of factors that go into making that determination. And again, okay. I wouldn't want to make a pre-decision here on August 12th and then on September 23rd or whatever the date is. Uh, we do something different and you say, well, I thought you said you're going to close school if that happened. Okay. Um, it's easy to say that today, but maybe not as uh, simple then. So we just want to evaluate all the aspects of it and make the best decision possible. If you had a crystal ball, which if you did, you'd be a millionaire right now. Um, what would you say to, I know you've looked ahead at the athletics that probably won't occur. Do you see our school year that we will have a full school year, even in the hybrid model? No. Okay. Thank you for answering that honestly. I really appreciate that. You're welcome. And I think that's it for me today. Thank you guys so much. I'm sure these are very unprecedented times and all of our angst and health and safety of our children and staff. It's, it's a tough, it's a tough time right now. Thank you. Hello. Hi, thank you for taking the questions. Um, it sounds like there's a lot of unanswered questions still, and that's understandable. Do you have a date in which these committees are meeting so that we're able to make a more informed decision? Which committees are you speaking of? Well, as people have asked quite a few questions, for instance, what do the days that they're not in school look like, you know, Wednesdays, how many hours is that? Which hours, what does it look like? Thursday and Friday, if they go to school Monday and Tuesday, what do projects and homework look like? What is the parent responsibility? Um, you've kind of consistently said throughout this call, you know, we're not sure, we're meeting on that, we're working on it. Do you have some dates of when we might have a few more answers to make these decisions? Uh, yeah, I would uh, say, um, and uh, by the end of next week, we should have some pretty good ideas of where we are in the things. Okay, that's helpful. And also, when we look at earlier, you had said there was a recommendation that the school teaches the core classes. And you had said that you can't change what the state mandates. However, there's also a state mandate of 180 days of education in which we seem to have some latitude in changing. What is the opportunity to say, you know, I, I get it at home, perhaps we could do the art projects and the physical education and, and some of that in more creative ways, but why isn't there an opportunity for the school to be responsible for the core learning? That's a great question. That might be the best question I've heard all night. Uh, <laughs> I really think uh, it would be good to pose that question to our governor and ask him that question, like why um, has he made those types of uh, potential changes for different courses? Or why has he put anything out about the 180 day requirement to help school districts and help parents make decisions? Um, you know, there's a lot of things that we're still waiting for clarification on. And so we're kind of flying blind in a way, trying to make decisions 
to help educate students, but not violate those regulations or laws. So if they could clarify that and give us new information, that would be very helpful to our planning process. Okay, I, I highly doubt that that will come directly from me to the governor, but I mean, as the school plans look, and I'm sure you have a lot of close communication, um, you know, just maybe something to, to look at because I know we've addressed kind of the equitable education earlier. However, if you look at kids going to school two days a week and then having homework or projects, as it was stated earlier, two days a week and online learning once, it's really hard to see how that could equate to the same thing as everyday online learning. Um, you know, for me, I do want the kids to go back to school, but I have a lot of concerns around what does Thursday and Friday look like and how will we be able to see that going to school Monday and Tuesday is equitable to going online five days a week. Are you going to be able to show that in terms of core curriculum? I don't think so. We're not going to be able to see that because a lot of it's going to be dependent on the quality of the online instruction. If the online instructor, uh, as one of the other parents mentioned earlier, doesn't give your child assignments for five weeks, well, you can have, you know, that, that person's experience is not going to be as good as being in a classroom, physically in a classroom with a teacher two days a week. I don't think anyway. Right, but it's only two days a week and you're saying it has to spread out amongst the curriculum as it always was, which means there's a bit of, I'm going to call it fluff in the schedule, right, when they're going to their snack time and their lunch and whatever it is, um, but then you've got three days a week of that not happening. And I'm just, I'm more curious about those two days a week that are at home. Is that going to be relevant to each school? And it sounds like you're saying to each instructor possibly, or is there going to be a requirement for the two days that they're not in school to provide a certain core level of education? No, what I said is we cannot require our teachers to do that. Could some of them choose to do that and volunteer to do that? Absolutely. Will some of them do that? Yes. But I can tell you which ones will and which ones won't. I know that's not fair. You're not getting a clear answer, but I'm telling you uh, with clarity that we can't mandate that. Okay, so if they start going to school and they go Monday and Tuesday, can I also do online learning? Yeah, on Wednesday, you've got Thursday, online. Friday, Wednesday. Wednesday. So for Thursday, Friday. No, not for Thursday, Friday, you know, not as it stands now. So you have to choose one or the other. You choose either a hybrid model with two days a week of in-person instruction right. and a week of online instruction, or you choose a full-time online model uh, as outlined in the WITS uh, information we put out this afternoon, um, and you pick that option. Or you could always look at doing like a home instruction uh, yourself and put a plan together and provide that to the district. Um, but I think those are about the only options right now. Okay, and will we hear from our schools individually what this is going to look like? Sorry, what, what is going to look like? What Wednesday, Thursday, Friday look like in my case? Well, yeah, you'll hear about what Wednesday will look like for online learning. But for Thursday and Friday, no. If I was a parent, well, I am a parent. I have three children in the district. I'm expecting very little to almost nothing from any of my children's teachers during the two days a week that they're not in school. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome.
Hello, Robert Meyer. Yes, it's actually Julie Meyer. Okay. Um, my first question is, um, if a parent chooses remote learning option and then the school is closed due to COVID, do you remain on your current remote plan or are you then joining a district wide remote plan that is different? Um, we don't know yet. Um, we'll have to determine that, I'm not sure. Okay, and that leads to my follow-up question. Um, you're saying that parents have to decide by next Wednesday what option they're going to choose, but um, it seems like Williamsville does not have a lot of uh, answers to these questions, a lot of I don't knows, which is fine, but now we have to decide by next Wednesday, um, are we going to know that like more than 30 minutes before Wednesday night or um, I'm, I don't know, are we, or are we thinking about extending like West Seneca and not starting up until later in the school year? Or what are your thoughts on when parents will have more information if we have to make decisions by next Wednesday? We have no plans to start up later in the school year. Our plan is to start on September 8th, uh, as always. Um, in terms of deciding if your child is in a full-time online program, and then the whole district moves online. Uh, will they keep their current teachers? It's possible they might, and it's possible that they might not. I don't anticipate having an answer for that until it happens. And then it'll all be based on staffing and student need. Okay, but what about having more details on the remote option before next Wednesday so we can make a clearer decision? What other details would you like? Well, you talked about earlier that you didn't know what exactly that would look like, if it would be every single day, if it would be twice a week direct instruction, if there wasn't anything like really clear cut about like the hybrid is two days a week remote instruction, two days a week in school instruction. A hybrid is not two days a week remote instruction. Well, excuse me, you know what I'm saying though. No, I know what you're trying to say. Um, but I just don't want anyone, anyone to, you know, get the wrong idea that. Sure, sure, that's fine. Um, I'll ask Dr. Balin to share with you more information about the remote learning plan. Hi, Mrs. Meyer. How are you? Uh, I'm well. How are you? I mean, I don't need to know anything specific tonight. I just want to know when we would be getting a little bit more details um, before Wednesday. That's all. Yeah, thank you for your question. I don't know if you've had the opportunity. Um, it was actually shortly before the meeting. We did send out some information tonight that helped hopefully to provide some of the questions um, that you have the answers to them rather. Um, what I would encourage is please revisit the information. There, there are actually some details provided there. The remote option is daily. You'll, you'll see that reflected in the information and it also outlines the approach that we are planning to take. But um, I would also say if there are any questions following that, um, any of us, myself in particular, I'm happy to answer any questions that any parents may have. 626-8030 uh, is my number. Um, I would like parents to have a chance to review the information. There are about six or seven pages of text there and hopefully we've done um, at least it, to answer some of the questions that have been posed this evening, presented some information that will help um, inform parents to make a decision that they may have. But please revisit that. I think in terms of the time frame, it's, it's all in there um, along with the, the offerings that we're planning. Okay, and then I just had um, one other question regarding like cohorts and specific schools like transit middle school. I don't know if this is particularly your forte, but do they know exactly um, the students will be moving in a cohort, but probably not in the middle school. They're basically going to be going to different classes just like traditional middle school with masks on, correct? Yes, that is correct. I, I will ask my colleagues to jump in too, but um... At the middle and high school level, as Dr. Martzloff has shared on, on other occasions, it's very challenging to try to cohort students. There are a number of classes that are offered and students are um, moving about. I think at the middle level, the movement is less so, um, particularly at grades five and six, but when you get into eighth grade or seventh grade, there are some other options that do take them to other classes. In addition, there are multiple sections of classes and classes running opposite each other in the schedule. So by default of the size, and you're talking, for example, about transit school in particular, there um, is a need to have multiple sections, even if it's the same class that's running. So you are correct about the cohort. It is um, very challenging and more difficult to achieve than, for example, an elementary level where in most cases, students are with a 
single or fewer teachers throughout their day. Thank you. And, and at this time, is synchronized um, learning um, is really not going to be offered in September then at this point? I know some people earlier in the conversation, Dr. Marsloff said, well, maybe it was something we would look into and we weren't sure, but I'm just referring for the people looking for doing two days hybrid and the, a lot of it, a lot of the conversation tonight seemed like people are very unhappy with the other two days that they could not get direct instruction. Um, and I understand you can't be at two places at one time. I just didn't know if synchronized learning would kind of help that situation, but that's just my opinion. Um, as far as the synchronized piece, if you're talking about the live in person, um, in the hybrid model, it's the days that our, their students are at school in addition to uh, some of the day on Wednesday, the remainder of their week would be still teacher provided. However, we not live instruction um, as I believe you're alluding to as far as the synchronized piece is concerned. So teachers are still planning for and delivering curriculum over the course of the days, whether or not students are in school. I think the key point that keeps um, resurfacing as a question is whether or not that direct face-to-face -face engagement will be possible on the days that our students are not with us physically. There is where we have the limitation because the teacher is with other students. So part of what is planned, however, those teachers have to plan um, their instruction to determine what is best taught live, which would be the time that they're in school with students physically and or that Wednesday, and what is best provided through other means for the remainder of the time that the students aren't in school. So I would regret if anybody left the conversation this evening believing that there is no planning involved for the time that students are, are spending their time out of school. That still takes teacher planning and direction to be able to afford students instructional opportunities that are meaningful. So we are not expecting that that is all created at home. We are going to provide that from the teacher. However, the work is done in an independent fashion by the, by the student. So I hope I helped to answer that. I'm not sure if I'm getting to where your question is. Oh, you did. And I totally understand those other two days, a teacher cannot be responsible for, if they're teaching a class to be doing something remotely. That's why I was just bringing up synchronized learning because the two days live what in-person learning could be watched then by the other children that at home and you could get full day, four days of instruction. Half the kids would be watching it from home. The other half are in person on the other day, but anyway, I, whatever. That's, that's, I just know that's what some schools are trying to do, but with the zooming and things of that nature. Um, do you know anything about um, the cleaning between periods? What's going to happen with that? Like exactly like a teacher's just wiping down desks or are the lockers still being everyone's still going to a locker, are they having cubbies, or how are you gonna maintain six feet of distance, like getting off the bus or in the hallway and the stairwells that are narrow, or as long as you have a mask, you don't have to maintain social distance, is that, no, we, is that kind of the assumption? No, we have to maintain both. Um, the guidance that's been given to us, it's, it's originally it was stated as one or the other, masks or distancing, at least that's the way some of the wording seemed to suggest, but really, as further information came to us, both of those must be in place. So from a distancing perspective, the mask must also be um, worn. But as far as buses or cleaning, I would have to turn that over if I could to my colleague. Mr. Thank you so much, Mrs. Balin. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Meyer. Yes, hello, Mrs. Meyer. As far as the, your first question, cleaning between uh, classes, that is something that will not happen. Um, we are unable to uh, use the cleaning and disinfecting process. It takes time for that to dry and students cannot be in the classroom and the cleanings when those chemicals are in, in use. So the protocol will be to use the sanitization and hand washing of students. Uh, every classroom will have uh, a hand sanitizer unless it's an elementary school and they will have their sinks with soap and water so that students can uh, wash their hands uh, when they enter the classroom and uh, when they leave the classroom if possible. Uh, regarding um, the social distancing, we are gonna maintain that as much as possible on buses. Um, without going into all the details on how we do routing, I can say that um, the present plan is to have a maximum ridership of 24 on each bus. That varies from what our normal bus capacity would be 
uh, which is down 66% from normal uh, to about 50%, depending on grade level. So we are taking that in consideration. And when everything is said and done, we really expect that each bus will probably have somewhere between 14 and 18 students on it. That's our goal. So we will be able to have appropriate social distancing in place. Uh, regarding lockers, that is something that will be determined uh, by the schools uh, and by the grade level. Uh, we want to make sure students are social distanced. So there might be uh, uh, new plans put in place so that students who are on different days will not be in the same location. So that is something that the school principals are working toward. Thank you. The only comment I have about that is I just find that a little um, disheartening about the cleaning in between periods. Now, I don't know if if something can be looked into that, but I do think that that is pretty critical. Um, I realize you cannot spray that spray in the presence of students. So I don't know if they're gonna modify how long, like the time between the period versus three minutes is now 10 minutes because you're moving socially distanced. It's gonna take longer to get to classes. You know, usually it's a mad rush of students walking very quickly. Maybe that would give time in between. Um, periods for teachers to clean or is an issue of teachers using those materials versus maintenance people using those materials? We, we, um, if teachers wish to do that, we will make them the product available to them, the cleaning solutions, but that is something that would not be a requirement. We can't require teachers to do that. Uh, and from a facility perspective, we do not have the staffing to do that. It's physically, there. that's just not something possible but we are taking all the uh, potential precautions we can. And that's why we're emphasizing the use of hand sanitizers and the wearing of masks. All of that is the protection that we have in place. Okay, thank you. I was just concerned about hard surfaces and hands and mouths and eyes and yeah. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Sean McCormick, are you there? Sean, if you can hear me, you need to unmute yourself. Yes, I'm unmuted. Hi. I was just wondering um, about Harkness. Um, I heard you um, talk a little bit about BOCES, but I wanted to know, um, I know my son was looking forward to going to Harkness in the fall, at least part-time. Is any part of that still? Um, possible or is that scrapped? Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Scanzuzo who will address your question. Thank you. Uh, hi, Sean. Uh, the question regarding Harkness, uh, we do have a preliminary schedule that Harkness is running for students. It happens to be uh, not uh, in line with, with our schedule uh, of the Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, they are going, um, it looks like every, every other day. Uh, okay. So week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one week, Tuesday, Thursday, the other. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it, may, it may create some, 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 uh, some, some scheduling issues. Um, but at this point, uh, we're still in conversation about, um, you know, what that'll look like. And if that's something that we can continue to support, we most definitely will. So will we be actually better off then? with the online program and then two days at, you know, Harkness, would that work better in terms of scheduling? That's, uh, that, that's something that we will discuss in, in, uh, in length and, uh, and determine whether or not, you know, that that's a formidable option for you. Okay. Yeah. Because that, that would definitely factor into our decision is, um, you know, my, our son is a um, special education student as well, but uh, he's not in, you know, the 12 for one class. So I think based upon what you guys are saying, he would be in the hybrid, but maybe subject to some services. I'm, I'm really kind of confused in terms of um, where he will be at um, being that he's in special education, but not in one of those eight for one or 12 for one classes. 
so having said that, when he is in face-to-face -face, uh, classrooms uh, in, in those days, he will receive uh, whatever whatever supports he needs in a face-to-face -face setting. And mm -hmm. if he is not uh, in face-to-face, -face, he will be uh, he'll be receiving uh, digital teletherapy, digital services, uh, if they happen to be needed on those days. Okay. And would that be possible to get those additional uh, services if we opted for, say, going online to make Harkness work? We would have to have, uh, we'd have to communicate as much as we can to ensure that the schedule uh, for your son's classes and when he's going to be uh, at the Harkness Center. Uh, obviously, we couldn't provide him services then, but we'd have to work around that schedule to determine okay. whether or not there are, um, you know, whatever services he's getting uh, and, and uh, support staff available to accommodate those services. Okay. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Okay. No, that, that's all I have. Uh, you know, as soon as, um, um, yeah, it's going to be a difficult decision, but I'm sure it's a difficult decision for all parents. Uh, I, um, I'll probably be touch, touching base with you again to, to kind of uh, nail down what would be the best uh, scenario for um, my son in terms of uh, what works out best for scheduling and hardness and, and services. Yeah, thanks, Sean. I look forward to that. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, hi, Scott. This is Sagar Joshi. How are you? I am good. Uh, just uh, listening to all the questions and also uh, hearing all the answers. Uh, first of all, let me just say thank you for trying to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, it's not a time where I'm going to ask uh, more uh, very, very specific questions because I, I, I understand uh, what everybody is going through. Uh, so I really appreciate you guys answering or at least trying to answer some of these questions. Uh, I only have two small questions and one request. Uh, part of the first question has been asked in different ways uh, till now about uh, what would be part of the remote uh, education program for five days versus hybrid. And uh, I understand that you may not have everything uh, buttoned up yet. Uh, I haven't had a chance to look at uh, the mail that has come through on the WITS website. Uh, but I think if you can make it more specific over the next couple of days so that parents can uh, make some decision on what format to go with would be helpful. Uh, I think it's very difficult for everybody to uh, choose uh, one format or the other immediately given the information, but any more specifics you can give uh, around what timing that would be, whether that would be, let's say eight to 11 every day uh, for the remote option uh, versus the remaining time would be assignments. Uh, any specifics you can give uh, would be helpful. and. If you have them now, great, but I, I don't think uh, you might have every little detail at this point. Is that correct? Okay, um, I'm happy to give you any details if you have any specific questions uh, to try to answer those for you. Yeah, I mean, my questions are essentially more specific around, uh, is there a particular time when the online uh, kids would receive a direct instruction from the teacher, meaning let's say everybody who is online would have a live instruction, let's say 8 a.m. till 10 a.m. and then from 10 to the rest of the day, they would do assignments or uh, they would have live instructions throughout the day. Uh, I don't think it is completely clear, but I haven't spent enough time on the WITS email to read through everything. So if you have any details, I would be happy to hear. Good evening. Hello. Um, this is Marie Balin, again, Assistant Superintendent for Instruction. So what you're speaking of actually is two um, separate and distinct models. As far as what we sent out today, 
that is the full 100% remote online option. So that is if students are at home and receiving all of their learning while being at home for a five day period, essentially. The hybrid model, I think what your question relates to is, when are the students receiving the direct instruction from the teacher? Please correct me if that's not your question, but that's, that's what I interpret. Um, that would be answered by, they would be receiving it um, for a portion of the time when they are in, um, on Wednesday. That would be on a schedule that we will provide. Um, we will have to stagger elementary, middle, and high because teachers will also be involved in other activities, but they will be receiving in-person instruction with the teacher for the days that they are assigned to be in school. The days where they are not in school, um, let's say Thursday and Friday for that A group and Monday and Tuesday for the B group, those are teacher provided um, opportunities for learning. They're not face-to-face -face direct instruction provided by the teacher, but those are assignments, those are projects. Those could be video-based uh, lessons that teachers take and provide those days where the students are, are at home in a hybrid model with the exception of Wednesday would not be live. Understood. No, I appreciate Murray. Uh, I understand the hybrid model, I think, very well at this point. Uh, okay. My only question is the completely remote model, uh, does it have a live, it seemed that there, it would be a live instruction every day uh, or a live schedule uh, interaction with the teacher every day. Uh, if that is accurate, if and if there are any timings, specific timings around it, like will it be full-time school, like eight to two live interaction, or is it only a couple of hours a day and then the remaining time would be assignments? That, that's where I'm going. So, so remote instruction, the 100% remote model includes the live instruction, what we're calling then the document synchronous learning, asynchronous, which is uh, not live, but it could be provided by video or through other means digitally and also independent practice by the students. It's a five day week program at the middle and high school level. What we're striving for and as described in the document, it would be emulating what the course schedule is. It might be a little bit abbreviated as far as the periods are concerned, however, because remember teachers and students will have to log on and off to go into various settings and more teachers are involved in delivering middle and high school programs. At the elementary level, schedules will be established whereby teachers um, will be interacting with students daily in both large group and small group, but it is a combination of all of those settings um, and factors that make the remote learning program um, robust and whole. The, whole. the whole approach at elementary is not gonna be in a live portion all day long. It's a combination of all of those models combined, which is described in the document. Again, if anyone wants to read through it and wants more specifics, um, that perhaps don't come out there. If they can contact me, I'm happy to describe it um, and answer any more details that we can. But um, as Dr. Martzloff indicated, we have to onboard the teachers. A schedule, of course, will be in place, but an elementary schedule, even in person, looks very different than a middle and high school schedule. But what we want to provide parents and students is times where they would be online or when they would be accessing their learning remotely. And it has to really be done with, um, even in an elementary setting, um, recognition of a kindergarten schedule may look um, slightly different than, let's say, a fourth grade schedule. So developmentally, that's going to have to be provided for as well. Okay. Now, thank you. Let, let me review this because I haven't reviewed everything around remote learning. But since uh, we are asked to make a decision by next Wednesday, uh, I am trying to get into the details around it. Not that any of this is easy. I totally understand it here. Uh, we are both working from home, so it's not easy for us either to manage uh, the kids' time during those times, but we are going to try to make it happen, and that's where we are decisioning whether that works for us or whether we should send uh, our daughter who is, who is entering first grade uh, to school. So thank you for that. Uh, one question I have is just around the logistics of different uh, school districts making the decision. Uh, we have a few friends in the South Towns and we are hearing that the schools won't open their, uh, or at least won't uh, open in-person classes till Thanksgiving. And I'm curious uh, how some of the decisions happen uh, here. And like, I would have assumed that every school district would do this exactly the same, but sounds like it is slightly different. Could you shed some light on that? 
Uh, yeah, I can talk about that. Uh, every school district community is different. Uh, everyone has different challenges. And I know there are a couple of districts that came out recently and said they were gonna start with full-time online learning for all of their students. I think they're trying to err on the side of safety uh, for students and staff. And uh, it remains to be seen if that's the right decision or not based on what the outcomes will be. Okay. No, thank you. I, I understand. Uh, I, I was under the impression that every school district will do exactly the same, uh, but I'm hearing a little bit different versions from everybody, uh, which I understand now. Uh, so I appreciate the explanation around that. Uh, I only had two questions. My only suggestion for uh, any of the following sessions uh, would be that uh, if it is possible, you could limit each parent asking like one or two questions so that all the parents are not waiting uh, for two or two and a half hours to ask their question. That, that's my only request, but I appreciate all the answers you guys have tried to give. So thank you very much. That's a good idea. And we're gonna take uh, questions from two more parents and wrap up for tonight. Uh, so thank you. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Marie. Thank you. Christine Sikorsky, are you there? Hello, how are you doing? Uh, my name is uh, Jim Sikorsky. Me and my wife have a couple few questions. Okay. Number one, when you start talking about the problems that you're having putting cubicles in class, I'm just wondering how much you saved on bus fuel last year. On bus fuel? Yeah. I know that Williamsville employs the largest amount of buses and being that there wasn't any buses from March till the end of the school year, how much money did you save? Our, our buses, we saved about $300,000 on bus fuel when it comes to the fueling systems. Well, don't you think that that's kind of crazy telling me that you can't provide some safety cubicles at that price when you've been told what they really cost as opposed to what you thought they cost? I just want one more item though on bus fuel, just so you know, um, the contractors, uh, all bus contractors are uh, filed um, letters with school districts stating that they believe they should be paid for the transportation expenses from the prior year, um, even though they didn't provide service. So. We've all been put on notice, and that is a pending, a could be a pending lawsuit. So we have to reserve some dollars for those potential lawsuit items. I, I, I understand that, but that is generally your problem that you have to handle as well. But there is a lot of money surplus there. And if you really cared about putting the money in a proper place, you would fight for that money to get it put to the proper resources, correct? We are, we work with the New York State and the A part, and we are working to try and make sure that we can provide the resources we can. The one issue though that you may not be aware of is um, New York State right now requires all school districts to have a budget and the equipment budget is what is uh, approved by the community. And those dollars that are paid last year, uh, even if we could use them this year, they're not in an equipment code. So that makes it difficult, but uh, we certainly try and meet all the equipment needs of the district. That's one of our priorities. Okay, um, my wife has a question. So if the hybrid plan is proposed and my children go two days a week, are the English as a second language children going into the classroom with my children four days a week that are only my kids are there too. They're there for. Correct. So what's the difference? Why is my kid not going four days and the kids that need to learn English are going four days? Because they need to learn English. So both of those kids that need to learn English and my kids and the other group of kids are all exposed. So why not keep them all together? I'm sorry, I don't understand that question. Okay. So 
my ch- okay a through whatever m or l or whatever it is are going two days a week the other half are going two days a week and the english is a second language are going four days a week we are all intertwined with those children what is the difference those children are exposed my children are exposed the other group of children are exposed why can't they all just go four because the difference is that the state is requiring us to utilize social distancing. And we can't use social distancing if we have all the students in school all five days of the week. It's impossible. Okay, so since my child can speak English, they cannot go four days a week, but these other kids can, is that correct? I don't know if I would characterize it exactly that way. I okay. think that certain vulnerable populations that we're attempting to provide uh, higher levels of support for. And in doing that, um, that's what we're attempting to make out. Okay, so my if I choose to send my kid to school, they're exposed to basically both groups and I have to homeschool them the rest of the days, correct? You have to homeschool them the rest of the day, which day? Just are- learning them the rest of the days. Okay. Um, not quite sure what your question is. I think what you're you're asking is you have kids that go to school two days a week and then you want to acknowledgement that you have to educate them the other two days a week. Is that what I hear you saying? Well, are you educating them the other three days? Are we? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. If I'm if I'm sending them two, are you yeah. schooling them the other three? Yeah, we're giving them online learning on Wednesday. Oh. They'll have other work to do on Thursday and Friday. So like this spring, the parents are teaching and we're utilizing the various YouTube websites and whatever else that's provided, correct? Um, I can't speak to the exact specifications for everybody on, uh, throughout their week for online learning. I think we will have a much stronger, more robust program if we've had an opportunity to do professional development with our teachers to better prepare them for this uh, challenge. Uh, when we started in mid-March, we had no time to prepare. It uh, came out of the blue and we originally thought we'd be off school for a couple weeks. We ended up off school for the rest of the school year. Okay, I completely understand that. And I, you know, I sympathize with the teachers and all the parents and everything like that. I just wanted to know making my decision and my husband's decision going forward, if my kids were going two days a week, if they were really with those two days a week kids, or if they were really exposed to the kids that were there four days a week, which is what's going on. So you're not really quarantining or social distancing by what you're saying because you're exposing everybody because you have two different groups of kids in school the same amount of time as you have a different group of kids there four days a week. I understand, but what we need to do is physically social distance students from each other. Mm -hmm. That's our main goal. If there's ways to avoid doing this um, and still provide higher levels of support to vulnerable populations, we'd certainly do that as well. Okay, well, I just think that, you know, it doesn't really seem like Williamsville has the handle on it that all the schools in Erie County said, and I know I'm not the only one to say that. Plus, I noticed that a lot of time during this, you've been rolling your eyes a lot at what people have been saying, and that isn't a a position that we appreciate coming from our superintendent. I have not been rolling my eyes whatsoever, number one. And number two, I think we are very prepared and have done a great deal of work to get prepared for this coming school year. Well, then you need to shorten your I don't know answers or we think we're going to deal with this as it comes. Those aren't decisions. As a parent, I can't make that decision of sending my child back to school based on the answers that you've given us tonight. I feel like we've gotten a runner. Okay. Thank you. And I'm an essential worker and it's extremely hard because one of us has to quit a job to stay home to school our kids the other three days or two days, whatever you're not providing instruction for per week. And I know lots of families are in this position and I feel for everyone. I feel for you guys. I feel for the teachers. It's just extremely difficult because now we're working on 
one partial income and trying to be a teacher at home. I understand that's very challenging and it's not something the district sought out to do. I know. We would like all kids in school every day starting in September. I know. And I wish that could be possible. And I'm sorry that you're getting a lot of the frustration from all the parents. It's very tough for us to make decisions, especially based on the vagueness of what's actually going to happen in a couple weeks from now. Thank you. Nadine, are you there? Hello? Hello. I'm Vince, actually. How are you doing today? Good, how are you? Good. Um, yeah, the, most of what I had intended to ask has already been answered, but just a little bit of clarification about the five-day-a-week remote learning program. I read in your letter and also you spoke of uh, being able to get back into the school without any difficulty if we elect to change over to hybrid. But it seems the other way around is not as easy. So if, if, if I elect not to go with the five day a week program and then a week or two into school wanna decide to go that way, it, it, it seems like that might not be possible or there might need to be a space situation or something like that. And I just wonder if I'm almost being encouraged to try the remote learning program first because I could always opt back into the hybrid system. I understand what you're saying. And I think the best way to summarize it might be, it might take a little longer to go from uh, the um, hybrid option to remote later, um, because it's gonna be based on staffing and availability of certain teachers for certain courses and things of that nature. It depends on what grade your child is in and different specifics that will come into play that will determine the outcome. Okay. And, and, it, and it also seems that if enough people elect the remote learning, the school is going to be nearly a quarter full instead of half full on those two days. And, and, and what kind of adjustments could be made to, to allow more face-to-face -face training because there are so fewer children in because people opted for the remote system. Yeah, that's a great point. And our only fear with that would be if we went and expanded the number of days students are physically in the classroom because uh, there were such a higher number of students taking full-time uh, remote online learning. Our fear would be that all of those students in that scenario would want to opt back into in-person learning five days a week instead of remaining on remote instruction. So do you, do you see or envision a, a, a cutoff point where you won't be able to flip flop be, because this classrooms are empty and that's not an efficient use of the system either? If it goes that way, we don't know where people are going to decide, of course. Uh, I guess it's possible, um, but I think if we reach that point in time, we might have to ask families who picked remote online learning to commit to that for uh, an extended period of time versus coming back to full-time in-person instruction. Right, makes sense. Anyway, again, most of my questions were answered and uh, I appreciate you doing that. You're welcome. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. I just want to say thank you to everyone for your participation this evening. We've gone slightly more than three hours uh, to answer questions and to hopefully clarify some concerns. Uh, we're going to continue to do this next week, every night of the week, and more information on that will be sent out to all parents uh, in the next day or two. So thank you for your time and your patience. I understand this is the most ideal scenario for everyone. 
but we're going to keep working hard to make it the best that it can be. So thank you and have a good night.